Okay, so I've got um, 602. Looks like the select board is all here. And um, and we're going to kick things off. I'm going to call the regular select board meeting to order. Um, first thing is set adjust agenda. Does anybody have anything that needs uh, to be changed on our agenda? You guys are good. Okay. Lucian, you're talking on mute, I think. Lucian, are you trying to say something? There he is. Yes, I am. Sorry. Oh. Um, Alberta emailed out about, I don't have the, the um, agenda right in front of me, but um, she emailed out about talking about town meeting. And um, we don't have that on our agenda tonight, do we? We do not. Um, okay. We could. Yeah, we can just mention it under um, new business if you want. I don't think we have any any clear direction yet on that. Nothing new. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. I just wanted to know if we need to put that on there. I, I know um, just a little bit about that, Eric. I mean, I can offer just a short statement. And let's do new it in business. New, business. new business. Sounds good. Yeah. Yep. All right. So we're going to, hearing nothing else, we're going to roll with the agenda as written. Um, so... First thing is select board to approve the minutes from last time, the last regular meeting, which was November the 5th. And we also had a special select board meeting November the 13th. We need to approve both those minutes. Um, does somebody wanna make a motion to that effect? Can we do it together? Yeah. <laughs> I motion that we approve the minutes of the regular select board meeting um, November 5th and the special select board meeting uh what was the date of that eric uh november 13. november 13th as written second any discussion on those minutes going once all in favor of approving the minutes as written please say aye 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 okay so i, I just to roll it out i think that's everyone sherry kaylee wiz lucian and me all said aye um, next up is communication from the audience. We have, looks like a fairly sizable Zoom audience tonight, which is great to see. Um, I'll just, um, I'm gonna just uh, preface this by saying, uh, for those who haven't come before, um, communication from the audience is a time to hear from anybody about anything really, but if you're here to for an item that's actually on our agenda, we'll um, include public comment at that time that we hit the agenda item. Also, just because our meetings have been running a little bit long recently, um, I'm going to try to limit the time that, that folks um, speak to like two minutes roughly. Uh, just to kind of keep us moving so we don't end up here all night. So all that said, um, anybody want to um, address the select board on something that's not on the, that you're not, that's not an item on our agenda tonight? Okay, rolling along. Um, first up is town manager's report given by Sean Fielder. Hey, good evening, everybody. We, uh, I'll, I'm going to keep it brief this evening. I know we've got uh, quite a bit of information to cover. So uh, under operations for uh, town offices, um, we did make a determination as of Friday afternoon that effective Monday morning, this month, last Monday, we're going back to uh, restricted uh, public access to our office space and anybody in a uh, office type role is going back to a remote work location. We recognize that's not ideal for business operations for customers and citizens that we have to service, but it's in the best interest of um, our uh, employees and the community, uh, given everything that's going around now with the uh, coronavirus uh, increases and COVID-19 positives. So uh, we're doing our best to uh, be available via phone and email, and uh, we are keeping our operations rolling. Uh, as of now, um, uh, field-based positions, you know, are continuing to follow the um, Department of Health and State of Vermont guidance standards in regards to uh, social distancing and uh, best management work practices as uh, 
as uh, controlled and uh, published by the Vermont Agency of uh, Commerce and Community Development. So we're we're keeping up on those issues. This um, the the limited access and public access does uh, carry over to committees, boards, um, other assignments uh, in, in town, if you will. So uh, we have asked that our various boards and committees also go to remote access approach. You know, as the example of the select board this evening, it's unfortunate, but it's what we need to do to uh, just try to um, do our part in uh, reducing the incidence rates of uh, coronavirus. Um, we did, uh, this is in the news now, so it's not new information. Uh, two weeks back, um, almost two weeks full now, actually two weeks back, we did have at our staffing level, we have had an incident of a COVID-19 uh, positive result for a team member. Uh, it is in the news that this was in our police department. We can't share information in regards to individuals involved. I hope everybody understands that we're starting to get into privacy and uh, HIPAA laws. So we really have to protect the interests of everybody involved. What we did uh, internally when we found out about this, um, what is positive here is that we took immediate actions to determine internally who we considered to be close contacts with the officer that tested positive. We made the decision uh, in advance of anybody directing us that we had two other team members that we would consider close contacts. So we put them into a quarantine situation. The positive news as of now is we are not aware of anybody else being negatively impacted. I know we've had we have had some questions directed at our department and at my office about you know what 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 may be the uh, issue in, in regards to public in case an officer was interacting with somebody. And the response on this issue is that if there were uh, an issue with you being considered uh, a close contact then you would have received a call from the Department of Health. So that's the, uh, that's the response on that issue. Uh, another positive thing that I would like to report right now is that for the team members that went into quarantine, they, are, um, they have since tested negative and they are gonna be returning to work duties. And the individual who tested COVID-19 positive has gone through the correct number of days without symptoms and according to the Vermont Department of Health guidance, we'll be in a position to be uh, back on regular work schedule effective tomorrow. So, um, you know, it's uh, the priority here too, I wanna make sure I'm clear on this, that the priority for uh, me as a manager, for my team and our town staff, and this goes for everybody involved with town operations, and of course to our citizens, we wanna make sure if we have an incident that that individual uh, does okay through the process. And I'm very happy and pleased to report the uh, person who tested positive is doing uh, very well and recovery is going good. Uh, this should not be taken to mean that anybody who ends up with COVID-19 is gonna be a, a speedy a recovery because we know from our national and our state news that this is a very serious situation. So, um, uh, two other quick points on this. We're keeping up on our field operations. So I wanna make sure I project to our, to everybody out there, citizens that we are keeping up with the duties that we have to do, whether it's uh, you know keeping our highways up, keeping our town business operations going, while it may be an inconvenience, as far as you being there in person, we're doing our best to keep up and provide service to everybody. So are there any questions on this particular issue? Because I know there's a lot of data I just threw at everybody. No, I think that's good. Okay, so uh, let me transition now to um, we have um, uh, we have made a, a move on our community development coordinator position. We um, did an interview process with a number of individuals, and we have selected somebody, and they have accepted an offer. And we'll have more on that individual's name once they officially start. Uh, the other candidates have been notified that we have selected somebody for the position. This will be starting up, uh, the, the plan start date is December 2nd. So this is good. Uh, we've got somebody that has a really good skill set coming in for us. And it's gonna be a, a really nice distinct advantage for us to have some additional support, uh, you know, in the short term on processing some uh, grant opportunities and uh, keeping things rolling there. So uh, this is, uh, we're, we're excited about this. So thank you to Sherry, she assisted with the, the candidate review process and some of those related tasks. Uh, Amanda and Casey also assisted, so thanks to them. Um, yeah, that's great news. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I, I think we, we really have somebody that uh, I think they're going to be a, a really good match for all of us and, and for the town, so it's very positive. 
Uh, we did get follow up, um, uh, just a couple of infrastructure things. The pedestrian bridge, everybody is aware, we've got a, a cable that's failed, so we're in a shutdown situation on that. We did get a report, uh, an additional inspection. The key point on this is that we have a follow up report. We've got some basic cost estimates. What I did this week is just checked in with a couple of uh, funding partners to see about what opportunities we might have to get some grant support on the project. Couple key points, replacement, um, excuse me, repair was not necessarily recommended, but it could be considered repairs back in the envelope estimate was uh, shown at a range of 40 to $60,000. Uh, that was not the preferred strategy that was recommended. Replacement was recommended. The number we saw for replacement was as much as $300,000. I suspect that might be a little bit low, but this is an engineering expert and that's the number they threw out there. So. We'll, uh, you know, we'll keep investigating what we've got for options on this. Uh, related for infrastructure projects, looking into uh, what opportunities we might have for public works garage replacement moving forward. And um, that uh, I'm just, uh, I'm doing a little bit of legwork right now in cooperation with some other department leads uh, to figure out what we might have for some opportunities there. Um, just one more thing. I did have a, a local contractor have a look at the public safety roof uh, because I know we had an additional incident that uh, Chief Cochran reported last time out. We had a leak in a heavy rain event. So I had a local contractor do a repair uh, immediately following the last select board meeting. So we've got a secure roof, uh, if you will, through this winter and spring season. And that uh, just bides us the time until we can get back into our bidding process for the replacement in this next uh, construction cycle. So I want everybody to be aware of that. Um, I guess what I would close with is, uh, you know, all of us um, have uh, some stress factors that are up, no matter what our positions, no matter what our situation. And let's just keep trying to do our part to uh, uh, limit the spread of coronavirus and you know, do our best to be respectful with each other. My, my personal comment here is let's not, to direct, let's not direct the energy at each other or if we disagree about the approach, let's direct the energy at uh, trying to eliminate the coronavirus. So that's what I would close with. Thanks, Sean. Does uh, the select board have any questions or follow up for Sean? So next up is the road foreman report. Is Tom on the line? Um, I don't see Tom on board, Eric. So I didn't get a chance to verify with him. I had anticipated him being uh, taking part today. I Maybe he's on a fire call. Um, so yeah. I'm not sure. Um, I, the basics I could provide here, again, I had anticipated him, in, uh, him taking part. I can just give the basics of... Um, I know there had been some uh, some work continuing on some grading when the weather was cooperating, but the key highlight, I guess, for the road report now would be obviously transitioning into uh, uh, winter uh, cycle and uh, you know salting and plowing as needed. And uh, uh, one thing, I guess, we do have um, our uh, truck, and I forget the truck number, but this would be the truck that uh, Pearly runs, and I've forgotten the number. We had that ordered up, and it has arrived, so we'll have that new vehicle. Um, probably in town, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Casey told me that's going to be picked up tomorrow. So that new truck's in as we head into our uh, winter cycle of operations for plowing, salting, and sanding. So that's good. Um, I, that's it. I guess those are the highlights, Eric. Again, I had expected Tom to yeah. be taking part, so I'm sorry I don't have more to provide. Uh, that's fine. Um, happy to roll on. So I think next up is um, the police report. Do we have Aaron Cochran on the line? So Eric, I'm going to take this one as well. Aaron's on vacation, actually. So I checked in with him um, just to have anything to uh, pass along. I did ask if we would get the uh, incident report, but I was reminded by him and Casey that that comes the first meeting of the month. Yeah, it's monthly. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess what I could add is, and you already heard the narrative about, um, you know, we, we had to do, uh, you know, quite a bit of administrative work just to make sure we were going about this process of uh, having an employee test positive and just do the right thing to get through that and try to limit any additional incidents. And, you know, as you just heard me say, uh, honestly, I'm, I'm pretty proud and pleased with our process. And you know, as far as we can tell, 
uh, it didn't, uh, we didn't have any additional incidents. And a, a key thing that I want to hear the public here is even when we had this issue going on, it did not impact our ability to provide service. So I want to make sure everybody understands this. If we have this issue, if it were to come up again and we felt we had uh, any aspect of uh, the police operations and or other operations being impacted, we do have uh, arrangements with others. Um, if the, if the Example is uh, public safety, and we have mutual aid uh, concepts longstanding to be able to get additional support to keep the services going. And again, I think we did a good job of being aggressive and trying to do the right thing to, uh, you know, limit the spread of this. So that's what I would add here. All that's right, it for um, PD report. Sounds good. Um, Select board have any questions about the road or PD? All good. All right. So moving right along, um, item number one is select board to discuss proposed AT&T cell tower on Buffalo Mountain and the access on the Buffalo Mountain Trail access and extension of the PUC deadline for public comment. And um, we have, uh, I know we have some residents here who are interested in this issue. We have Janiel Smith, who's um, working with AT&T on this and has been in contact with the town. And I know that, um, so I know that Sean and Mike Sullivan from uh, the electric department, mm -hmm. I think Janiel and an engineer all met on site um, like a week and a half ago, maybe, or mm -hmm. roughly, and um, looked at the situation on the ground. I know at that time, Sean had asked uh, if it would be possible to do another balloon test because um, folks in town hadn't had the, oh, we were able to see the pictures, but people hadn't noticed the balloon and able to see it. So they were hoping to do that again. And I think Janiel said that mm -hmm. that would be possible, but we need a weather window to do it in. Um, and then the other thing is we'd heard from residents that, um, and that in the, our planning commission that um, folks would like a little more time to review the proposal um, as compared to uh, the town plan, especially. And so we'd asked Janiel about the possibility of extending the deadline for public comment, which I believe is a possibility. Um, anyway, there's my long preamble for our discussion. Um, so uh, maybe Janiel, since you're here, do you could you give us a little update on on where things stand? Sure. Um, I have Beth Kohler here as well from Downs Rackland, and she'll show us a bit about the project. But to touch on your comments, um, Eric, uh, yes, uh, we will need to do some sort of a tolling agreement, but AT and T is amenable to um, an extension so that there's some additional time to review the project. Um, and for the balloon test, we're looking at picking a date and uh, because the weather has been challenging, maybe December 2nd, because next week we're looking at the, ho the holiday, um, maybe December 2nd with a backup date of the 3rd or 4th, which is the Wednesday following Thanksgiving with a backup weather date of that Thursday or Friday. Um, it would be from nine to one. It would be noticed on the Downs Rackland Martin website. Um, and accessible so that anyone with an interest could keep their eye on the dates and the updates um, to see what the weather is looking like and to make sure we're on track for Wednesday or if it's going to need to be pushed out. Is the weather issue primarily wind? It's in part, yes. They, uh, they need to have a low wind speed. That is a, a major factor, but also rain. Um, can no storms can have visibility issues as well. Okay. Rather than expect the public to go to the law firm's website, why not send the date to Front Porch Forum, which is which comes into people's lives automatically? Janelle, well, hi. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so Elizabeth Kohler, I'm an attorney with Downs Rock and Martin representing AT&T uh, and um, I go by Beth. Um, I, you know, I don't think we're opposed to that. I think the best way to facilitate that front, front porch 
forum distribution is uh, for somebody who is in the town and a member of that front porch forum to post the website link in, you know, in the front porch forum. I think Why not Don, just send them the announcement and have them put the announcement on front porch forum? Um, as a paid advertisement? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it's a public you service announcement. Talk. Yeah, what? you and I can talk about that. Again, I'm certainly not opposed to it. We're definitely in favor of, kind of you know, wide distribution of the notice. So if you, you know, as a resident, that makes sense to me. This is Doug with the Harbor Gazette newspaper. We are happy to work with you guys to put something out there. That'd be great too. Sure. So we have a form of notice drafted on the on our website that we typically use, and that's what I'll use to distribute. If that could um, especially go to um, Sean Fielder, our town manager, then that would, he can facilitate distribution, right, Sean? Yeah, he can. <laughs> and, and, and I that's posted on the town website as well. Sean, you're breaking up. At least I think it's yeah, you. We would, we would play a do both to get. Yeah, we got you down for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's locked wonder, up. He disappeared. I if you could leave it up for longer than that, because nine to one is basically working hours for most people. And I think if it could be up for longer than that for multiple days, that'd be great. Is that possible? Um, I don't think multiple days is possible. Um, you know, we can try to extend it a little bit longer or, or perhaps start it later and have it go a little bit later. Uh, but there's just technical challenges to keeping balloons up, uh, you know, for extended periods of time. We have found four hours is, you know, kind of a good amount of time before you start compromising the test. I think I was reading the state regulations the other day and they said that they're talking about four days, I think, if I remember, right? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't hear you. I think I was looking at, at some of the state uh, regulations. Office. I can look it up and try to find it again. But um, they're talking about keeping the balloon, I think, the balloon test up for four days. Um, yeah, I, I, I've been doing this for 20 some years. Uh, and um, yeah, I've never been um, participated in a balloon test that lasted multiple days. Okay. I'll see if I can find that. Um, uh, so that's, I think um, it sounds like there is a plan to do a, another balloon test. It sounds like um, we'll figure out, we'll coordinate the communication and the push out between Sean, if you guys can, AT&T folks can send to Sean Fielder and he can coordinate the push out locally to the Hardwood Gazette and to the Front Porch Forum. I think that could work. Um, and um, and then the point about, um, could we extend the comment, the public comment period? Can you guys yeah, comment so on I, the I, comment I period? Yeah, so I, I, I've done that with a couple of towns uh, pretty recently. Uh, and um, I have a short form of tolling agreement. And basically the tolling agreement uh, you know, the parties agree that the 30 day comment period, the expiration of that, which for this petition would be October 24th, that we would extend the expiration date by X number of you know, weeks uh, in order to provide for more time to do the balloon test and to gather more comments. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll work, you know, I'll work with the town on, you know, for, I, I understand that you guys were asking between four and six weeks uh, and I think that's fine. I think we just need to look at the calendar for holidays. Like we don't want any kind of deadline to be right around a holiday. And with so I just think, you know, in that framework, at and is agreeable and I have a, a form that I'll share with you to, to make that happen. I also typically like to ask the Department of Public Service, their attorneys uh, about their position. A lot of times they don't take a position, but sometimes they do. And so I will 
uh, after tonight, reach out to the department uh, to see if they have any comments about this extension. Great, that sounds good. Um, I just wanna, uh, Kaylee, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify, Beth, that um, it's our understanding that that would have to be done by tomorrow in order to meet the state deadline. Is that correct? The deadline is November 24th and it would need to be submitted three days before that deadline? Yeah, I, I know the, the PUC prefers the three days uh, and I'm certainly in a position to be able to share that tomorrow. Um, so cool. we can get that and, and I can take care of filing it and it's very, it, 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 yeah, it's actually oftentimes we don't even file it because right now it's really an agreement between the two of us, um, but um, uh, actually, no, I'm sorry, I take that back. We're in the petition phase. So yeah, I will get that filed, but I can do that uh, very easily. Great. Um, we have uh, Dave Gross as the chair of our planning commission and he's joined the meeting tonight. And um, I don't know, Dave, we think you were here for this whole conversation, right? So I don't know if there's any questions you have for, for these folks. You're on mute though, Dave. You... It's the joys of Zoom. I'm muting myself, okay. How's that? That's better. <laughs> My wife, Tracy, wishes she had that button. Um, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> uh, just for background, um, the Planning Commission has an emergency meeting um, to discuss this amongst the Planning Commission on Monday, uh, 6.30 Zoom meeting. So that's just out there. Um, officially, we, um, we were notified that the um, petition was going forward. But our understanding of it obviously has evolved since our last planning commission meeting um, uh, this month. Um, so this will allow the commission to get together and take a look at um, the relevant documents and uh, discuss um, what next steps would be. So I don't want to speak out of turn for the planning commission. So that's where we are. I have uh, glanced through some of the um, documents that were provided um, with the filing. And um, so that's where the Planning Commission is right now. The only thing I would say, and this is um, just generally, we do have the town plan and there are specific items. And then rather than have the Planning Commission be kind of like the sole person, we really think since the plan is approved by the select board, thus it's the whole town, that the idea would be pick up the town plan, go through and find things. So I would just refer people for refreshers, page 11, scenic resources, where it says, uh, quote, the scenic importance to the community and Buffalo Mountain is specifically listed. Um, in the goals on that section, it's identify, protect and preserve are the key words, um, natural features, and views are specifically listed in that. And then policies, um, two of them, telecommunication towers and any other large obvious structures should be carefully cited to minimize impacts on scenic resources. That's a policy approved. And development around the natural scenic resources identified should be cited and constructed in such a manner to retain the natural scenic beauty of the area. Um, going down also structures should be screened or hidden from view as best possible is the language. So that's just quoting what's been approved as policy of the town. So I encourage people to go and read that as a starting point in the discussion. And I believe there's also something in there that says that we, we do want, um, we want telecommunication, telecommunication coverage for our town as well. Yes. So it sounds like just from a timing point of view, if you guys are meeting, um, if planning commission is meeting next week and then 
uh, select board meets the first Thursday in December. Anyway, it sounds like if we had four to six weeks, it would be enough, right, to for us to roll through. Kaylee? Eric, I disagree with that based on the holidays and also the state of COVID right now. I think that we're all switching to online and we're all kind of, it's gonna be a rough holiday season for a lot of people. And I think we're asking uh, the planning commission to do a pretty quick turnaround to look over all this, as well as ourselves as a select board understanding this process better. If it's possible, I would at least, so six weeks would put us essentially at January 4th, January 1st. Um, and I also, we don't know exactly what might be happening with schools or um, with our state. I think we should, if possible, at least push the deadline into February, maybe March, just based on the current state, um, if that's possible. I'm, I think kind of assuming that from Thanksgiving to the holidays is going to be difficult for a lot of people. I don't know if it's giving our town enough time to do the work that it needs to do together. Hmm. So I, I'd just like to, to speak to that for a minute. Again, I think we can push it uh, towards the six weeks. I mean, more than six weeks put, can put us on uh, January 8th. Um, but again, I, I just to you know remind everybody, we filed an advance notice on the project uh, in April, uh, and I understand the circumstances that we're in. Um, we filed the petition in October, uh, and so you know, again, I think moving you know moving this out into February, March, um, it, it isn't reasonable, and it actually isn't in line with kind of federal law on how quickly um, you know municipalities need to react to telecommunications petitions. So. Again, I think we're willing to push this. Uh, and, and again, I think the six weeks is more than generous. Uh, I do, you know, we will be available. Um, you know, we, we can participate on Monday's meeting uh, if that's helpful. But, uh, but again, I think our position is, um, you know, the six weeks is, is sufficient. Eric, I don't know if you saw, but David lifted his hand up. Yeah. I did not see. Thanks. Okay. Um, just as an aside, obviously the um, balloon test I heard discussed as far as um, getting some input from the community. Um, if we have our, well, we will have our emergency meeting at least to get up to speed on Monday, um, we would the second Tuesday have a regularly scheduled um, planning commission meeting in December, um, which would give us a chance, depending upon when the balloon test was, um, hopefully we could solicit some community input. Um, and we'd have something to discuss from that point. But that's kind of what our timing would be. I guess um, if push came to shove, I could check to see if another emergency meeting would make sense. But that's loading us up with a lot of meetings. So, and like um, Kaylee kind of pointed out is how much input are we putting in versus just a discussion of what the plan says um, that's already been approved by the town. So one thing I just wanted to, when, when I was talking about the balloon test, I looked back and it was our, it's our zoning that says that the development review board may require an applicant to fly a four foot diameter, brightly colored balloon, et cetera. And it has a whole bunch of stuff in it. And I know that our um, zoning stuff doesn't apply entirely in this, but I think it's within within their, I don't know what you call it, their right or whatever to, to ask for, for that to be extended out. Because I really do think that th three hours during a working working time isn't really adequate. So if that, if that could be um, extended some way, that'd be great. Would, would it be desirable to have it on a Saturday and Sunday or Sunday instead of a work day? I think it would be, yeah, or both. Well, we, remember, we have already done one balloon test and provided the package of uh, photo simulations. So right, this would but, be the second. But even on the select board, I didn't know when that was happening. I don't think many in the community did. So I think that's the important thing to us, and anyway, is that the community people would be able to see it. So if right. we can 
try to coordinate around that. That would be great. I think we can coordinate for we, we can talk to our balloon test crew and see if um, a week a weekend day is feasible um, instead of a weekday. Again, it's it's very weather specific, and then we're dealing with two days out of the week instead of five days out of the week that are options. Okay. Um, Lenore, do you want to say something? I do um, about the balloon test. I'm just looking at the bylaws and um, so it does need to be brightly colored and the one that they flew was, well, the public had no notice and it was gray or silver. Um, it also says in our bylaws, it should be flown at least eight consecutive daylight hours on two days. Yep. I think again though, yeah. But I, I think it's it's my understanding that in this case, that our bylaws don't necessarily they're not bylaws exactly, right? Aren't they? It's... Yeah, we're we're not seeking we're not seeking a permit uh, under the local right. re zoning regulations uh, through the PUC. Yeah. Yep. But the town has a very important role to play, even in, you know, in the proceedings before the Public Utility Commission, and and that's why we're here. Yep. Talking about this. Um, uh, Dave? Just real quick. Um, just as a point, once again, um, the purpose of the balloon test is to get input from the community and the bylaws for whatever project have identified a brightly object, uh, bright balloon is um, appropriate so people can see and notice it um, for any project. And whether it is required specifically for this. I think the intent of the bylaw to solicit input so people understand what they, where the um, tower is and be able to identify it should be respected, though it obviously is not forcible. Sure. No, we'll, we will talk to our balloon consultant, uh, um, you know, and uh, recommend red or, or yellow, a bright color. Um, I have a question from the Harvard Gazette. Uh, AT&T has not really been very clear about the 5G issue, uh, whether or not this tower will support 5G. Everybody has an opinion about 5G, but nobody is getting any detailed information, uh, not just as to whether it will be 5G, but whether this tower will benefit the town economically by having that. Uh, so, you know, AT&T, um, is deploying 5G uh, in in you know uh, you know nationally. Um, I don't know what the timeline looks like for Vermont. Uh, I do know that any deployment of 5G anywhere nationally in Vermont uh, will meet the FCC guidelines for you know safe RF admissions, uh, and so um, you know and and that is. You know, that is the law and that is what AT&T routinely demonstrates by way of compliance and its permitting applications. Um, do other, Kaylee, or, or you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Beth, for being, um, to, to meeting these questions and to, and to helping us through this. I am, um, just to your point about the Saturday or Sunday, if it's possible to do a balloon test on a Saturday, um, that is often when a lot of a lot of community members are going to Hardwick for trash and recycling and various other things. I think that would be an optimal time, um, if possible, to do it. Uh, even nine to one Saturday would probably be a good timing. Yeah. You know, uh, we're, we're certainly not opposed to that, and we do run balloon tests on the weekend. Uh, and again, you know, just to Parrot, what Janiel said, no, you know, weather is our number one challenge in getting these um, tests completed successfully. So, uh, but certainly uh, we will make that, a, a, you know, a priority if it works, uh, great. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know we have a lot of folks here. Um, Rachel, did you want to say something? And I haven't been able, making. I haven't been good about making everybody state their name. But when you unmute, could you state your name? Uh, thank you, Rachel Kane. Is that coming through clear? Yep. 
Thank you. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Yeah, it, it, it's become clear um, that the whole process surrounding this proposal has been kind of mixed up. Um, it hasn't been kind of proceeding in an orderly way. Uh, I don't blame our boards. Uh, it's been a difficult year uh, to have ordinary meetings. Um, and, you know, but there's just been some unresolved questions. Um, telecom issues are really complex. Uh, and I think uh, for us, it's been a case of like, you don't know what you don't know. And, um, but from, you know, but where we're standing right now is looking at a, a you know, petition being a filed for a certificate of public good um, already filed by at t before our planning commission uh, or development review board uh, or the public have really had any input. It has not been well advertised. Um, you know, there hasn't been hardly anything in the Gazette. Uh, you know, it's, it sort of strikes me that the town is well, frankly being taken advantage of. Um, you know, but by by people that really know the process really well, uh, you know, they're complex issues. And I, I wish that the state or Vermont League of Cities and Towns would have some office or some people that could help towns navigate these issues. Um, you know, and some of us have just been really in the last couple of weeks, uh, just like learning about this and getting, you know, trying to understand how it works. Um, certainly our bylaws have some irrelevant pieces and there's a lot about a balloon test that's supposed to be advertised in the Gazette, you know, 14 days before. Um, and that wasn't done when the weather was good. So now we're looking at like lousy weather to do it. But, you know, if, but there was no involvement of our planning commission or development review board to even communicate, uh, you know, with at t or the, you know, this is how we like it run. Um, our planning commission is supposed to be involved and they haven't reviewed it and now they're supposed to figure this all out in a meeting or two. Uh, you know, it seems kind of unrealistic. I, I did for timing and I did write uh, to you all at the select board um, to ask, you know, for an extension, but honestly, I have to agree with Kaylee, uh, you know, January it's not it's not that much time and I think that because the planning commission has not been involved they hasn't even I think been studied at their meeting I think I don't know if that kind of invalidates the whole petition um, with the public utility commission um, and it, it's such a difficult time also for people to meet um, for people to be outside to look for a balloon, uh, you know, or just to get together for information about the ramifications of this, or just to even talk it over, you know. Um, so I, I really think I would really urge our board to really think about um, asking for more than 60 days or whatever, yeah, 60 days. I mean, I think we that you know we that our boards need more time to do their diligence and for people to know what's going on here thank you um, rachel i'm going to i'm going to butt in and and just try to keep us I'm moving finished. but thank you i'm finished thank you very much um do we have other people uh on the on the meeting here who would like to say something Sorry. Yeah, and that. Oh, this is Emily Langsner. Hi, Emily. Hi. Um, I agree with Rachel that uh, more time is needed. I think there's a lot of ways that this impacts the community. I know for one that um, my son um, hikes there on the Buffalo Mountain Trail and. Um, that um, that they would have an impact on him and other school children like him who who need to have uh, COVID safe activities where they can be outside, get fresh air, and um, maybe do things in that with that opportunity for social distancing that are still um, 
valuable activities, and um, I just have concerns about um, that resource, uh, that natural resource of uh, the trail being uh, bladed by having a cell tower there, um, that, that it's not going to have the same character, uh, uh, Buffalo Mountain or the Buffalo Mountain Trail. And, you know, I have concerns whether it's really a, would be a safe place for kids to be. Um, he goes there unsupervised now, and so, you know, and I'm sure other kids might do the same thing. And if there's a dangerous cell tower on near the trail or on the trail, it, it's just that would, you know, send up a red flag for me. So um, I, it's a, that's just one of many issues. And I, I just think that, uh, you know, we're heading into the holiday season when families, um, you know, don't really have the energy to be thinking about uh, a cell phone tower right now. Um, it, it's, you know, I, I just think that, the, you know, it's, we're we're basically in the holiday season now. Black Friday is next week, and, and it's shopping and New Year's, and um, there's so many uncertainties. So I, I just think that maybe the usual type of extensions that that might apply should be doubled because of the the kind of situation that we're in now with this uh, pandemic. Thank you, Emily. I'm going to cut you off there if that's okay, because I want to give everybody fine. a chance that's to say really something. That's fine. That's really what I wanted to say. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Emily. Okay. Um, uh, I think, Annette, did you have your hand up before? Uh, why don't you let the woman who has her hand up speak first? Judith? Are you, you're going to need to unmute yourself. There. Yep. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I, I'm Judith Ruskin, and I'm a retired elementary school teacher. And um, I take children up there, one, one specific child. And alongside the trail that goes from the the um, community gardens up uh, Buffalo Mountain across Cooper Brook. There are planks uh, with labels uh, educating children about the wetlands that I believe Hardwick Elementary School may have put in. If they haven't put it in, I, I think they may come there. And, and just another thing, this is being rushed so much. Uh, the spring before last, there were floods on um, Granite Street into the lawns and into the community gardens. Um, and the wetlands um, soak up uh, flood water. And Route 14 by M&Ms for quite a while was closed during those rains. Um, and, and it's believed because there was um, filling in of wetland areas there. So that's a, a huge problem. And, and to have this rushed through without time to mull over this, um, uh, it, it's just a shame. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who hasn't spoken? Going. Who's? Doug? Yeah, I, I, I am just curious if there's been any kind of analysis as to what sort of economic benefit this might have for the town. Not on the part of the select board, like we haven't done any specific sort of uh, financial analysis. Um, I don't, I don't know that that that's something that we really had considered all right, thanks. Sorry. No, I was directing that more to at and to see if they had given us any kind of indication. Oh. I would imagine that at and would be looking at the financial benefit to at and not to the town, but. <laughs> well, if there are people that are skeptical about the project, in other words, then they would say, this is why we should do this for the benefit of the town. The benefit to the town is improved coverage. And we have one cell tower in Hardwick. The goal here is to better cover the downtown area. 
and some undercovered areas of Hardwick. Right, which, which in particularly in this day and age is, is, is critical. It's critical for public safety. It's critical for education, online learning, you know, is, you know, a big part of our lives right now. Uh, being able to work from home, being able to build businesses from home, uh, you know, the, the economic engine that good communications provides uh, to a town, it, again, it's hard to quantify, but it, you know, it is real, it drives property values. Um, so, it, you know, it, it really is fundamentally important for your community to have strong communication services. Thanks. Um, uh, Megan, Megan's had her hand up for quite a while. That's okay, Liz. You're gonna have to unmute yourself though, Megan. Yeah. And um, say your name. Megan Hall. Um, I'm, um, I'm curious what the additional coverage will be in the town. Yep, yep. so that's a yeah. good question and I'll let these folks address it, but we do have coverage. They have submitted coverage maps that we can which is really, I think, the best way to look at it. But do you guys want to speak to that? Well, I, you know, I did come prepared with a few slides. Uh, I know time is short, uh, and so uh, they did include uh, copies of the propagation maps that were part of our petition. Uh, and again, you know, the the advance notice back in April went to the slip board and the planning commission. The full petition uh, notice of its filing. Uh, in October uh, went to uh, the select board and the planning commission. So, you know, certainly AT&T has been, you know, very upfront and, and, you know, kind of provided the advance notice, the petition notice um, to, to the town, regional planning commission, state agencies, adjoining property owners. So uh, we have really done our job in communicating uh, our intent to move forward with the project, the scope of the project, uh, again, I am, you know, we are willing uh, to offer up an extension, but I just, again, you know, to the point that this seems like, you know, uh, we've done anything on the slide that is just not true in any way. Um, I'll just say, Megan, that um, it, until you get a chance to look at those uh, um, coverage maps, um, my interpretation of them is that it largely covers the area that currently has coverage, but with better signal, um, with a few additional places being covered, like heading south towards Woodbury on Route 14 has would get coverage, and areas out towards Mackville. And but it's it's kind of still the village of Hardwick is the main thrust. That's just my interpretation. You should your mileage may vary. I've looked into it a little bit and I, you know, it's, it's hard for me to interpret exactly. It just doesn't, in my opinion, seem like it's going to provide a whole lot more coverage than we all already have right now. Um, well, and, and again, subject to Janiel agreeing, uh, we're happy to, you know, to provide in addition to the prop maps, you know, a calculation of additional roads covered and residents you know, population covered with, with the improvements from the site. We do have a consultant we can ask about more detailed coverage maps. Kaylee and Wiz are both waiting. Wiz, Wiz had her hand up first, Eric. Okay, go Wiz. Um, to the question of, of what good is it to the community, I'm reminded of a study that I read a few days ago that has put out by the, a group two groups at UVM actually, Center for Research on Vermont is working with a group called the Vermont Futures Project, looking at the approximately 10,000 people who have come to Vermont to ride out the pandemic. They did a survey of those people and found that roughly 30% of them are giving serious thought to staying. These are highly educated people who can do their, tele can do their jobs through telecommunicating. Um, and they say that one of the critical factors is the quality of the internet service um, that they're going to need for actually doing their telecommunicating. 
Many of them are in Chittenden County. Actually, most of them are in Chittenden County. But other than Essex County, um, they were pretty well scattered around the state. And so I think there's no question that this will be, if it does broaden the coverage or even if it just increases the bandwidth, it will be a benefit to the community. You know, we have trouble with our signals and I've been in a lot of meetings and courses online in which I've gone in without the video because I don't want to use up the bandwidth with that video. Um, I, th I think there's no question that this is a benefit to the town. Kaylee. Um, that was a great study. Thank you for sharing it, Wiz. I, I, well, that kind of derailed what I was going to say, but um, I just want to clarify with Janiel that, that a cell tower would be providing cell phone service, not internet services. Is that correct? Well, actually, there are many services that are covered by um, telecommunications. Okay. Internet of Things is the next wave, for instance. Great. Um, so I just wanted to also, um, I think there's a lot of information that has been brought to the select board. And again, thank you, Beth, for, uh, and to Janiel for providing a lot of information. Um, I was going to, so what we were mainly discussing tonight is this extension, um, extending the public good is basically for as long as we can. Um, and also, if we can have an additional special meeting between now and that time, that is separate from the planning commission and separate from our next select board meeting to really go over those slides that you have Beth to go over this information, I think would be really beneficial for our community. Um, unfortunately, our website and is not necessarily available to everybody. Um, so maybe having another meeting like this, that's, that's again, a special meeting, maybe it's hosted by the planning commission and the select board to go over some of those nuts and bolts. What is the coverage going to be? Um, there's a lot of information that we've received from AT&T that I think would be helpful to have kind of broken down for our community. Um, but in my mind, that special meeting is different than the decision that the select board has tonight, which is to, is, which is to for how long we extend the PUC if we do. Um, is that correct, yeah. Aaron? Yeah, I mean, if you're asking me, I think um, my the two things I wanted to hit on were the balloon test, which I think we've covered, um, and the, the extension, which, uh, I mean, I hear the different points of view about extending longer. And I mean, I think, to be fair, I think Elizabeth, or Beth is totally correct with the dates about when this was um, officially uh, noticed to the town. Also, I mean, it's been it's been well over a year since we first met Janiel and talked about this project. So the select board anyway has been aware of it for quite a while. Um, and I don't, I, I guess um, I, I'd be more inclined to uh, go the route that you just suggested, Kaylee, and try to do like some sort of a public informational session, but not drag it out. Like, I, I guess I don't, I don't want to see the select board going over this over and over again for the next three months. That doesn't sound like it would be useful at all. So I'd rather try to put a more, like give us a little tighter timeline and make us meet it. And I think that that, and I think um, Beth had mentioned the, it's the, I pulled it up the February, um, sorry, January um, 8th or yeah, something. Yeah, if you'd like to file the tolling agreement tomorrow, it actually would be really helpful if we could agree to, to Jan January 8th right now. Uh, and again, you know, as that date approaches, if we, if the parties feel like we still have work to do, you know, we're open to talking about it. But again, I, you know, I do think that that's generous at this point in time, knowing where we are, we're going to do another balloon test. We are very happy to participate in a special public uh, meeting session uh, to try to, you know, to hear the community's concerns, yeah. to answer them. Uh, you know, we, that's we can start that with a PowerPoint presentation, which a lot of times gets everybody kind of on the same page. Yep. That sounds good to me. And I actually think that that date of the eighth is okay, but I'm just one of five on the select board. So um, we have a few more people who like, looks like um, Susanna, is that, would you, can you unmute, say your name, please? Thank 
You still need it. <clears throat> If you put your mouse over your picture, if you if you mouse over your picture in the top right, is there a little blue mute thing? Oh, there. Yeah. It did. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I I just actually would. Uh, there are a couple of things, but um, one I'd like to hear from Annette. She started to talk and it got interrupted. Um, and two, um, and maybe this isn't the appropriate moment to bring this up, but I would like to hear from someone or two things. One is why the permit, why, why the filing for the um, permit happened before there was access to the road granted. And um, I'd like to hear who on the select board is gonna be the point person for uh, contacting the PUC. And, and, but now I'd like to pass on my moment here to Annette because I'd really like to hear from her. Annette, would you? Okay. Um, my name's Annette Smith. I'm executive director of Vermonters for a Clean Environment. Uh, I've been asked to take a look at what's going on with this uh, in terms of the process because I've, I've been assisting towns and citizens in participation at the PUC for quite a while. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not offering legal advice. I'm, uh, but I do have a lot of experience from the position you're in trying to get up to speed with the PUC process, which for a lot of communities is kind of like a foreign language. Um, so uh, let me tell you what a normal process would have been like. Um, after you got the 60 day, no 60 day notice, that's the time for, for instance, your planning commission uh, to hold a public hearing. It's an opportunity for the planning commission and the select board to provide comments to the applicant so that they can approve, they can improve their application or uh, give them a red flag if there are issues. Uh, none of that happened. And I, I'm under the impression that the reason it didn't happen was because of this unresolved issue about the uh, trail and the town has to give permission and Hardwick Electric. And I still haven't gotten a sense that that's resolved. Um, and so I, as Susanna uh, raised the question, how, how does that and when does that get resolved? But that I think is what has caused things to sort of go off track here. Then once the petition's filed, you have this 21 day period um, and the Public Utility Commission, despite what many people think, which is, oh, they, they decide and that, you know, the towns don't have a say. This Public Utility Commission wants to hear from the towns. And in statute, and I, I provided um, your town manager with a copy of the part of the statute, there are actually four elements for you to consider and what the PUC looks at from the municipality's perspective. The first one is your town plan. And so that the town plan speaks for itself when those words are looked at by the PUC. The second element is recommendations from the Municipal Planning Commission. And so the Planning Commission meets, does an evaluation of the town plan to determine if the project is in compliance with the town plan. And that letter of recommendation is the second element. Third element is the recommendation from the select board or the municipal legislative body. And that can uh, also rely on your town bylaw. And so in your case, the idea would be that if that bylaw came out of your DRB, then the select board might advise or ask the uh, DRB to do an evaluation of the bylaw to see if it, if the project complies with the bylaw and point out where it does and doesn't. And then the select board would submit that as part of their recommendation. The fourth part of this is uh, the recommendations of the Regional Planning Commission. And you are part of the NBDA which apparently doesn't do what most other planning commissions do. I served on the Rutland Regional Planning Commission for about a dozen years and was on the committee that looked at Section 248 and Act 250 applications. And most planning commissions have those subcommittees. Yours doesn't. 
And so unless you ask them to go in and do a review of your uh, regional plan and compliance with the regional plan, it won't happen. And I, apparently they have, it. they just, they don't usually do it, but if you ask the staff would do it, but it doesn't sound like that's just something that would happen. But in any case, I wanted to point out that the, there are elements of what your town can do to provide to the PUC that will help them in making their decision. And your recommendations uh, create a rebuttable presumption at the PUC, which means that they can still override what you say, like if you say you don't want it, they have overridden towns that say they don't want towers for good reason, uh, finding that the public good overrides that. So it's not definitive. Uh, if you're cheerleading and say, yes, we want it, we want it, we want it, um, and it doesn't comply with your town plan, these are the, the, this is the balance that the PUC has to make in these cases. Specific to the discussion about the extension, there is also in statute that once the petition is filed, the clock starts ticking for 180 days, and the uh, AT&T people have mentioned a tolling agreement and I don't know what that means, but I wonder if it means that that one eight, because the clock has now started ticking, does this ag agreement for the extension um, stay the clock until it starts up again? And that's- Thanks, that's Annette. A, and and um, so- So that's, that's helpful, I think. Um, so. And, and so that, you know, then the other question is, when this deadline ends of, of however long a, a, an extension you're getting, does the 21 day comment period start at that point? Or are you expected at the end of that period to meet the, uh, the deadline for intervention and, and filing your recommendations? So I think those are things that you should sort out at this meeting. Okay, thanks. Um, uh, Beth, could you explain what the tolling agreement, what, what that yeah. means? Yeah, so, uh, so the, the tolling agreement is limited to extending the public comment period. Uh, and, you know, Annette, I think you did a great job in explaining. Um, the, under 248A, that comment period is 30 days. Uh, and for this petition, it, it um, that 30 days ends October 24th. So what we're offering and by way of the tolling agreement is giving the town six additional weeks to file comments or seek to intervene. Uh, we are not, uh, you know, um, nor do I think we can with the tolling agreement, it's, you know, affect that 180 days. That's a statutory date by which the PUC has to take action. So uh, we are not, um, you know, the tolling agreement cannot affect that kind of change and extend that 180 days. So it's really, again, I think, it, uh, you know, the intent here is to address what I hear the town's concern, which is we need more time yep. um, yeah. to formulate our position on this. And, um, and, and so again, that's what we're proposing, you know, here by way of yeah. the tolling agreement. Wiz? Beth, twice you have used the date October 24th. The first time I assumed you meant November 24th. Do you oh, really yes. mean October 24th? No, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I meant November. It's in a different time space continuum. <laughs> exactly. But uh, again, I just wanted to, let's see, the petition was filed on. See. Right, so it was uh, the petition was filed October 21st, uh, and then I calculated that 30 days to take it to the 24th. It likely followed on a Friday or, or Saturday or Sunday, so I moved it into Monday. Great, Sherry. So there's still the question out there that. Annette put out there that I was also thinking about, and that is, um, and from a select board member perspective, I mean, my understanding of this all along was that um, our only uh, place in this was in whether or not they could use the road or trail access. 
Am I wrong about that? Well, it, because... before the before the filing of the petition that got filed, even though we don't know if they can use that yet because of the HED. Can you clarify that a little bit? Eric? Uh, okay, no? I'll try. I'll try. So I my understanding is that um, that yes, so for all comers, um, if anyone, and this has come, you know, private citizens have come to us before and said, hey, I want to plow this class four road or I want to improve this trail. So that is always the jurisdiction of the select board. And that means that, that if somebody wants to improve or, um, you know, plow a, a road that, you know, beyond, then they're not the town government and the select board needs to grant that. So yes, that is something that we have to approve. I think additionally, um, the town is like automatically um, able to the town from what I've read the the municipal body of the or the government of the town which is a select board in our case and the planning commission and as somebody mentioned also the regional planning commission I think but it, in our case we have the our select board and the planning commission represented here and those two bodies are able to comment during the select board or during the public comment period of this um, with the of the certificate for public good. I think that's what we're after, right? Yeah. From the PUC. So um, the town can, we could, we can weigh in as a select board. We can weigh in as a planning commission. Um, I think that it would be best if at all possible to coordinate so that we weigh in as a town, um, not as a planning commission and a select board separately. But, so that's, right, but haven't we been waiting for them to determine whether or not they can even um, do what the electric department requires with, and I think we, with respect yeah. to the Buffalo Mountain Trail, which is our road um, in the town? Right. right. So my understanding is that when folks met on site um, recently, that there was a verbal uh, discussion that was yes that they that AT&T would be able to meet the the Hardwick Electric Department construction standards um, in terms of you know poles and going underground and rights away and all that and so then it would just come back to in order to fully meet it and guarantee access then they'd need permission from the select board to you know upgrade and and plow the um, Buffalo Mountain Trail. Hmm. Have they got that, permission from all of the landowners that that abut the trail where they can't get through the rock or are they going to dig through that rock and bury the cables under there? Janelle, you were there. Yeah, so it's primarily going to be an underground um, buried coax and um, it needs to be a certain number of feet from the center of the road to allow for future expansion. So Hardwick Electric has adopted the state standards and we have construction drawings being developed with some detail that shows the compliance with those standards. And I think the other part of Wiz's question was about um, easements or from, from right. landowners. From the I don't think there are many in between there maybe two or something but two is yeah. two the easements will be based on the final construction drawings because um, we need to identify those those required easements okay so sounds like it's yet. not firm not a done deal yet we have some easements in place Haley is that a quick comment and a question, Eric? My first question is, do does the select board need to make a motion or vote on any item agenda tonight? And my second question is, I'm just looking at the calendar and I know, Beth, that the eighth is the six week mark. Um, our first select board meeting in January that I think this is the calendar would be the seventh, which again, I think is a really tight timeline if it's possible to make it the week after um, because we theoretically only have one or two more select board meetings before that deadline. Um, so if it's possible to have the extension be um, 
for even the 13th or 14th of January, that would allow us a little bit of wiggle room. Unless my calendar is incorrect and that's totally possible. I think you're right. That's what I saw too. The eighth, we, have, we should have a meeting the seventh. Uh, do you know, I think you and I need to, to confer after this, but certainly something that uh, if we can do it, we'll do it. And I'll represent, you know, I'll put that in the draft of the tolling agreement. Uh, it, you know, again, I think we need to go back and talk to at and a little bit more, um, but. Um, I think we kind of need to make that decision tonight, don't we? I'm sorry. We kind of need to make that decision tonight, don't we? As a select board anyway. Right, because I think if if it needs to be filed tomorrow and um, we're meeting tonight and not tomorrow, um, we need to kind of agree on, or at least you know we could. I mean, we could. I don't. I don't know what what does a tolling agreement entail? Do you? Um, I assume. I mean, for most things that the select board. Uh, does we at least need to have um, a vote in the minutes to uh, kind of show that we've done we've taken some action and I, I guess I would um, I, I have seen communities do it two different ways they they okay. have relied on the vote of the select board or where they the select board votes to designate somebody who is authorized to you know execute you know, finalize and execute the tolling agreement sure so. yeah we do that too yep Okay. Uh, again, can I just speak to, I mean, if you have a meeting on the 7th and that is an opportune time to have finally, you know, formed your position and, and vote on, on a filing with the PUC. Uh, and again, the filings with the PUC are electronic. Uh, and so, you know, that, you know, that's. You, you know. do it on the 8th. Yeah. So does it make any legal difference if you're filing for the extension or if the select board or the um, planning commission is filing. I don't, maybe someone, maybe Annette would know that if there's any difference in that. So I don't Jeff, think, it, yeah, I, I, I don't think it matters what party files the tolling agreement with the PUC, but the PUC is going to expect that, you know, the, it, it's an agreement between the parties. So they need to, you know, it, it, it needs to represent that we're in agreement. What's the difference between just filing? I mean, when I was looking at stuff earlier, it looked like you could just, any party could file uh, for an extension. And I forget there's some kind of name for that. But I, the tolling agreement is something I haven't seen before. And so that's something different. That's an agreement between parties rather than just a party filing for an extension. Is that what right. you're saying? Right. And so what are, what are we agreeing to at this point that would be different than just somebody, us or you filing for an extension? Uh, it, it, if the town saw it, uh, again, I can't give legal advice to the town. I, um, you know, I, I can say that at t has never unilaterally sought to file an extension of time of the public comment period. And I'm not sure what the PUC would do with that. Also, um, I, I think I read that if, you know, the parties are in agreement, then the PUC is more likely to look favorably upon the request. So we would just be mutually agreeing to for the a date. Is that the extent of it, or is there other? I don't understand why it's called the polling. Why well, it's what, Lucian? So we would just be agreeing as a select board and at t to the extension, and that's the that's that's the, yeah. the full extent of the, of the tolling agreement. Is that right? Right. It's called a tolling agreement because it, it just stops the clock on the public comment period, the thirty days. Uh, okay. Right. Again, absent absent a you know the PUC extending that time frame, you know, typically because the parties have agreed and filed a tolling agreement, uh, the thirty days will expire, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know so the town would have to act prior to that thirty day period, or uh, you know it loses its right to intervene or file comments. Mm -hmm. Seems like a simple way to extend it. Um, sorry, Lucian, were you saying something else? Uh, no. Annette, did you want to say something briefly? Yeah, I think the town has a couple of options at this point. One is to enter into the agreement with 
AT&T. And that did, I believe, did happen in the case in Menden where AT&T filed their petition, but then the, the same day filed a 30 day uh, extension. And I, I'm not positive, but I think that restarted the, the comment period. Um, so there is some uh, history of this. The other option would be for the town to uh, file a notice of intervention and um, file your own letter about the circumstances and make the request. In general, the PUC seems to be very willing to grant extensions these days, but the, the, this unresolved issue about the access is something that uh, if you wanted to tell the PUC the reason that you're in the situation you're in and why you need more time, um, that's, that's another option you have. And also in, in some cases I've been aware that select boards and planning commissions in the same town have taken opposite positions in cases. So while uh, you suggest that it's um, best to speak with one voice, that actually is not necessary and the planning commission can intervene separately from the select board if they want to. Yeah, I saw, I mean, I certainly understood that from what I read. I just, I would really prefer that the town get to a point where we could speak with one voice if possible. I understand that's not necessary. But, well, the, and I also, this 180 day time period that the clock is ticking on, um, I don't know whether that might be uh, you know, the fact that the application was filed before the, the access road was, was firm, um, I don't know if that would be a reason for actually staying this 180 day period until that issue is decided. Um, okay. So that's, um, a, that's another thing for you to consider. Thanks. Kaylee? Eric, I was just wondering if at this point, if we should entertain a motion or if we needed to hear from anybody else. I would like to move on. I feel like we've been on this um, for quite a while and we have more business. So I would love to have a motion to um, join with AT&T for um, extending the comment period for till the 8th of January, if that's what people would like to do. Or, or I guess maybe what we would need, sorry, let me back up. What would work better, um, since it sounds like there's something that Beth could work on tomorrow and would need some signature or something, maybe authorize uh, a motion to authorize Sean, the town manager, to enter into agreement to extend the public comment period to the eighth. Maybe we could um, move to, to try for the 14th. And uh, she said she could, Beth said you could check back and see if that would possibly work. And then uh, I could offer Sean to, to do that if it works. Something between the 8th and the 14th then? Sure, sounds good. <laughs> Is someone making a motion? Uh, <laughs> so moved. So moved. <laughs> yeah, good. So moved. I love it with the um, so moved. Can we just repeat that though, Lucian? You want to you wanna repeat that one? <laughs> yeah, I'd like, I'd like, I think I, 14th, I think would be better for us. And so, and that's that she could check on that. So if it'll work, let's do it. And if not, then authorize Sean to do it for the eight. So you want to formulate that into um, like, I move that? Yeah, I move to authorize Sean to enter into an uh, agreement to uh, um, extend the comment period. Is that what we're doing? Sure. Yeah. Or should we call it a... Um, to I've extend the it. expiration of the comment period. There we go. To extend the expiration of the comment period. Good. So, and to communicate with AT and T about it and try for the 14th. But if not, he can do the eight. Second. Any more discussion on the select board? I just had one really quick thing. It's, if it's yeah. possible, Sean, to just because it's such a tight timeline, to just loop us in tomorrow um, when that happens or. Um, I know sometimes Fridays are a shorter day. Um, so I just, it's a really tight timeline. So if, it'd be great to get updates tomorrow if, if possible from AT&T and, and Sean. Yeah, no, I, I will get a draft of the agreement out in the morning. 
So I'm glad to do the update, but we're not going to have the time to go back and forth and, you know, get feedback that, oh, this doesn't work or that does work. I mean, I got to just go with what we, you know, hear back from Beth and AT&T, if, if that's okay with everybody at this phase. Yeah, yep. That's the point. Yeah. Very good. Can, can I also just add, this is not, I don't think it necessarily needs to be a motion, but I think it would be advantageous to schedule a special meeting of the select board between now and then potentially convening the planning commission and also having a presentation from at and or at least or at least we could do this we have all the information um not necessarily the expertise but just showing the documentation that has been provided for us yeah i think that's a great idea i'd like to wait until after the planning commission's had a chance to meet and hopefully communicate back to us any any comments they have and then uh schedule that so we still have a motion on the table that's been seconded um, to uh, to empower the town manager to enter into an agreement with at t to extend the um, deadline and public comment period into the beginning of January. Is there more, com more discussion on that? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Lucian, did you say aye? Yep, aye. Okay, so I think that's everybody. I think that's Sherry, Eric, Kaylee, Wiz, and Lucian all said aye. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone. Dave Gross, you want to say something? Yeah, just one thing, because obviously this coordination between the Planning Commission and the Select Board in our limited time, we are going to have the meeting, we'll review it, but um, I think what might be the better way, and we'll see it with the commission agrees with me, but what I'm going to propose probably after we discuss it on Monday is to see if we get some consensus and hopefully we might get some input from the public um, also, but to send a recommendation to the select board rather than directly um, to AT&T in &T and a separate thing so you could cite that we reported out favorably or unfavorably or had these concerns sure. and that might re um, reduce the requirement for us to meet and um, basically draft out our own recommendation. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm also happy Haley. to attend. I'm also happy to attend that meeting on Monday if it's relevant, David, or your your meeting in December. Okay. Everyone's invited always. <laughs> so fun um that'd be great kaylee if you could if you had time to go i think that'd be it would help provide a, a good um liaison connection thank you all right thanks everybody i think we're going to move along to our next agenda item even though we could you know discuss towers all night i think we have other things too so thank Beth, you all. I yeah Beth, I opportunity but thank you so much everyone really Beth, i just uh Beth, this is Sean. I just sent you my direct line in the chat right to you. So if you can just check, yeah, your check the I'm chat. I'm trying to send my number back to you, but I'll, I'll email you my contact. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Thank you very much. I'll Great. talk to you in the morning. Yeah, thanks yeah. a lot for your help. Thank you very thanks. much. Thank you. Yeah. Good night. Good night. All right. So next up is item two is the select board authorized town manager to execute agreement with engineering firm for wastewater system design contract services as part of the request for qualifications process. So we have a RFP out in the world. Sean, do you wanna tell yeah, us about this? Sure, so uh, we did uh, in a previous meeting, we did go ahead with um, uh, select board authorized that we would uh, advertise request for qualifications for the wastewater uh, improvement project. Uh, just remember that we were um, at that time and uh, just closing out a preliminary engineering uh, report uh, services with uh, Aldrich and Elliott. So we did advertise for request for qualifications. Uh, as a friendly reminder, the objective with doing the RFQ process is that uh, puts us in the queue with the Vermont DEC Clean Water State Revolving Fund to potentially be eligible for 50% grant forgiveness on the design aspect of the project moving forward. We did have three firms that submitted information to be considered following the RFQ posting. 
those firms in no particular order that we received information from would be Dubois and King based in Randolph, Aldrich and Elliott out of Essex Junction, Weston and Sampson with offices in Waterbury. The town staff, we had a review committee that uh, included myself, Tom Fadden, Ken Lacasse, Lucian uh, was involved. Casey was providing support on just keeping track of the information and the numbers. We reviewed all the proposal information received on November 6th. The recommendation to the select board from the review committee is that the town move forward with design services uh, with engagement with Aldrich and Elliott. So that is our recommendation. We would be seeking a motion from the select board at this time to uh, go ahead with them. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. Select board. If there are no questions, I expect a motion. Yeah, I moved that we contract with Aldridge and Elliott for contract services for the new um, uh, sewer plant improvements. Great. Second. Sure, Eric, you got the I, second because you were on mute, Wiz. <laughs> can I offer something real quick? Just clarification yes. here, Eric. Yeah. Um, uh, the way this will go is that uh, what we're doing at this phase is just um, acknowledging that we want to move forward with Aldrich and Elliott. What we would do is then uh, we actually would be completing a step two planning loan application. When that item gets in order, then we actually will get additional information from Aldrich and Elliott where the select board would then authorize entering into the actual agreement for that work. So this literally, the step this evening is literally just acknowledging that we do want to move forward with Aldrich, Aldrich and Elliott just for clarification. Okay, so I should have, I guess. It uh, yeah, I was confusing for me too. I had to research and just make sure we're right. But we basically have it correct in what you've outlined, Lucian, but just all we're doing at this phase, you'll get more information is the point I'm trying to make to the select board. We're going to get the details on the numbers and, you know, the other related data. That's what I'm trying to point out. That will likely be at the December 18th meeting. Uh, excuse me, 17, excuse me. I still second. Thank okay. you. Are there dollar amounts? This is stuck in the Gazette. Are there dollar amounts attached to these proposals? Not as of yet. And that's that detail that comes out where at the next meeting, we would have that level of detail. We did have estimates previously um, for the, uh, and I can't remember off my head. I want to say it's 50,000 or something, but it may be off by any amount. The rough, yeah, the rough number after, again, this is not a final because, the, you know, we're authorizing now to enter into uh, yeah, yeah. them proceeding. It, the rough number would be, that's probably a little bit north of our final cost, assuming we get this 50% grant on the planning aspect. Yeah. All right. So anyway, or, uh, motion on the table is to move forward with Aldrich and Elliott. Um, any more discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 I think that's everyone. So I count Wiz, Eric, Sherry, Lucian, and Kaylee all voting aye. Correct? Mm -hmm. So good. So that's motion passes unanimously unanimously. And thank you for moving this along. Everybody who's uh reviewed those um requests for qualifications responses. Um next is item three is um is the evening budget review. So we have Casey to present draft um, budgets for trails, library, office payroll, um, fire line items, and uh, the revenue and budget summary. Hi, Casey. You're on mute. I forgot. Hi, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Yep. Okay, so we're going to start with trails in case Norma would like to depart after. And so this is trails. Um, why don't you talk about this, Norma, if you'd like? Okay, so the trails, we um, made two changes. One in the salaries, the salary stayed the same um, per hour, but we increased the number of hours to 200 hours. Um, to better reflect what um, Wayne does out on the trails. It 
helps a little, probably not completely. But um, we also, in turn, decrease the amount that we budgeted for equipment repair and maintenance. Um, there's only one year in the past five that we went over the thousand dollars. We thought, you know, we could take money out of the capital budget if something broke down. But we have a new snow machine, so one new one, one old one, but we figured we could get by with a thousand dollars. So, so um, our budget actually decreased for this year. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, so in full disclosure, I'm also on the uh, Hardwick Trails Committee, but I think, um, uh, I, don't, I don't really think that it's a, there's any conflict of interest there because they're both town things. But anyway, um, does anybody have uh, questions for Norma while we have her? No. Um, all right, uh, it's a small budget. It's a small piece of our overall budget, but I, for one, appreciate seeing something go down a little bit. That's always helpful rather than, <laughs> rather than going up. So thank you. Yeah. Great. All right, Casey, okay. let's move on. Let's move on to library. All right, I have to, I have to stop the share to change. So just a second, okay. please. Yep. It's fine. It's still easier to read this way than when we're all in person, honestly. For sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, this paper, Eric. I know. But Wiz doesn't get the recycling. <laughs> You're on mute, Wiz. <laughs> You're still on mute. Yep. <clears throat> okay. It just I disappeared. Okay. <laughs> we, uh, is this a oh, library? Must be. Yes. Okay. There we go. All right. So we have Jody and Lisa on the line, as far as I know. Yes, I am is that here. correct? Yep, you're here. Jody or Lisa does one of you. Um, so do you yeah. want to talk about the budget? Let's let me kind of go down. So let's go to, um, I can go back up after, but um, let's just kind of go down towards the bottom first. Maybe you can talk about um, the increases and that sort of thing. Go for it. So we are projecting that our addition will be done within six to eight months. And one week I've been presenting um, increased costs because of the addition. We had shown you that we would expect to have increased heating costs, electric costs, and custodial costs. Custodial being the one staff cost that would have to definitely increase because of the increased square footage. So I have incorporated those figures into this budget, um, looking at um, perhaps having the addition being inhabited for six months. So um, that's why we have uh, increased at 6.91%. We also, if you look down at miscellaneous income, we had agreed that we would raise some of that money, um, do fundraising for that, so we're increasing that up to $8,000, which would be again, half of what um, we would normally have put in 5,000 there. We increased it by 3,000 more because we said in our extended costs that we'd go up by 6,000. So that's 5,000 plus half of 6,000, 3,000 make 8,000. So um, yeah, those are, the, those are the major drivers um, our budget increases. Uh, anything? I'm just going to look at the top scroll on top if there was anything. Um, Everything else is pretty static. So, so I did have a question. When are you going to start construction? What, do you have an idea what month? 
We're aiming for April 1st, depending on the weather. Um, okay, so April, and if you're thinking six, my, I guess my one thought was, and I just thought of this today is with the increased costs, I'm wondering if those costs aren't actually only going to happen about halfway into the year. That's what that's, Lisa had said. That's what's in the budget. Right. <clears throat> oh, okay. So this is, this is factoring in like about six months of increased cleaning then. Just, okay. Yep. I didn't hear six that. Six months of increased heat, six months of increased electricity, six months of increased custodial. Now, okay. of course, these are numbers we hope are close to accurate, but um, you know, we're still in the process of designing the new HVAC system. So there's a lot of uh, unknowns. It's looking like we'll have a very efficient um, heat pump system with an improved envelope for the new building. So we're, these are guesses for what the new heating costs will be. We'll have better numbers after six months. Oh, it's kind of exciting to think that um, that we might have the addition uh, uh, occupied by you're saying <laughs> dig December of twenty one or January of twenty two something like that. That's our hope. Yeah, um, best ballpark was about a six months of construction. So, wow, that gets us there. Assuming we don't run into too many snags, but um, it'll probably depend a little on the weather and when we can get started and the. Uh, the demolition has been just uh, held up by the environmental release, which is on a 21 day hold and then a 30 day public comment. So it's wow. probably not gonna happen until the spring unless the weather happens to just be very mild. So. Well, it sounds like it's a good thing you got started on it though. If you have a, it would be, it'd be a right. shame to figure that out in the spring when you want to start right, construction. Exactly. No, we'll have the release by January, it looks like. Um, we just maybe even mid-December, but it'll it'll be pretty close. There's advantages to doing it in the spring also. We may get better pricing by rolling it in with the construction. So um, it may not we wanted to do it to have it done, but it may end up saving us a little bit of money. So it's okay. Yeah. Do select board folks, do you have questions for Jody or Lisa about the library budget while they're here? Um, my question is just because I'm new to the board and to the library budget, but um, if, uh, just because of the state of our world right now, if construction does get pushed off to July 1, does that, um, the appropriation is still the appropriation correct? Like it's still the town saying this is the amount of money that we're um, voting for. And then if, and then it gets, I, I guess my question is how does it get adjusted if it changes or it doesn't? Yeah. So, okay. So just one point of uh, clarification on wording is that it's not really an appropriation because it's actually within our budget. So technically the appropriations are the things that we vote on separately at town meeting to, to other organizations. But um, even though it does say appropriation in here, doesn't it? I just <laughs> always said that. Yeah, we could change the language, certainly. That's just been there forever. So we could, we could put town allocation or something like that if you wanted to do that instead. I think that that's there as a historical artifact because it used to be the case, the town didn't mm -hmm used to fund the whole budget for the library. I think when I started on the select board, um, it was just the town, um, the town did a lot of it, but then the library um, raised money for, or maybe it was the friends, maybe it wasn't the library proper. Well, there were grants that came in that don't, that don't come in anymore, right, Lisa? Yeah, well, we raised, we would have <laughs> matching funds for the um, youth library in position for six years in a row. and. And actually, when I first got to the library in 2000, the town just cut us a check for what they voted for in town meeting. And we, our treasurer did all the bookkeeping and everything else until 2006 or seven. So it was, right. it was quite a different situation then. Right. 
and so probably this whole the language and the way this budget is laid out has been carried over year after yeah. year but really the way it's treated now to get back to Kaylee's question is it's just a sub budget of our overall town budget it's one of the things that goes into making up our budget so if we um if the select board puts this into our overall budget relatively unchanged or whatever we change it anyway it ends up in our overall budget when we get to town meeting the town will vote on the total budget as a whole package and so if the construction for example let's say you know was pushed out six months and so they didn't actually have any increased costs for operations within this budget year that we're looking at then um, any excess would get rolled into the fund balance at the end of that fiscal year. That totally makes sense. I think it was the appropriation that was confusing me. Thanks for right. explaining. I, for one, really like that we change. I think we should change that term to allocation rather than appropriation. I think it makes a lot more sense. Yeah. yeah. Just for people reading it in the town report and everything, too, it just makes more sense. Right. Okay. Um, good. All right. More questions for um, library folks. <clears throat> um, it's terrible. I can't get everybody to show. Can you size your window to show more people. It was difficult. Can't see everybody. So that's because of the screen share. Eric. Show, I, show because of the screen share. Oh, right. Yeah. I did. I did do a grid. Okay, so everybody's good on this? Yeah, okay. okay. Thank you Thank you for putting this together. Appreciate um, the work that goes into it. I know it's a little bit of um, forecasting with the unknowns of the addition, but. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of unknowns in the next year and a half, but. Yes. We're going to have a beautiful, beautiful library soon. Yay. Yay. And we can celebrate well, it in a, in a COVID free world, we hope. Yeah. Oh, won't that be lovely? We're going to invite you all to an amazing party for the grand <laughs> opening, and there'll be no COVID. And we'll all be able right. to be hugging each other. And we invite the whole town. <laughs> yes. We can all cough on each other. Celebration <laughs> of the library. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you Thanks for your Thanks. support. Um, Casey, what are you, what are we going to look at next? Office. Office, I believe, is what I put after that. Okay. okay so um, I'm going to go down to the bottom first. Um, so we have um, a total overall of minus one point seven. Um, Part of that, so the biggest changes I'll highlight here. So under our payroll part-time and elected, we have um, kind of matching up with some previous, like for election officials, I mean, it's only $500, but that's a 25% reduction. Um, then part-time labor, just because we haven't really used that very much, we decreased that. We wanted to keep a little bit in there. So that's down 40%. Social security expense, um, that aligns with previous as well as for the new community development coordinator. So aligning that more appropriately um, brings that down 20%, at least so that. Um, and then in the top section, um, computer software and services, you'll notice is out, up about 40%. Um, NEMRIC alone, our support is 5,000 a year. So um, that's why we have that at 6,000 because then that gives us a thousand for, you know, virus software and IT calls and that sort of thing. Um, and um, what else is up quite a bit? So um, VLCT passive and health insurance. So health insurance, we're expecting some plan adjustments as well as regular increases. Um, workers comp and unemployment are likely going to go up a little bit. And again, some changes in dental vision life set or dental vision statuses and the retirement expense goes up as your, if your salary is increased. So that's where that comes from. So the total for the overall office and 
payroll is down 1.7%. So pretty flat, about a difference of $1,200 over last year. What's the deal with the uh, election expense? Wouldn't that have, why is that so low? Because wouldn't that have been higher? So it should have been, it yeah. was higher for the year that we're in because this was a right. presidential election. Right. Right. Oh, I was looking at the, the other, there's another one up above. So maybe I was just looking at the wrong thing. If you scroll up. Election expense. Right. So in, it wouldn't have been that hot. Would, 1500. What's that about? Right. That would have been fiscal year um, 20. So then I would say it's going to be closer to 1500, maybe a little bit more in our current fiscal year. So we're just going to keep that the same. What can you explain that? Because what, what is that expense? And wouldn't it have been more? Like all the ballots, all the voting stuff that the town clerk needs for elections. Right, but why is it only 846? We just went through a major thing. Like, did the state just pay for stuff that we usually pay for? Or No, the 846 is the year before. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's, okay, it's, I didn't understand. Yeah, okay. that's FY20. That's what I mean, yeah. I so see. the FY21 figures might even go beyond 1,500. I mean, that's okay. what we're shooting okay. for, but they're definitely going to be probably double that. Okay. But wouldn't our it was a presidential the state did secretary of state's uh, office did process on like presidential election as an example oh true but, so yeah. we it may not be double then because that's right they did cover all that postage and all the mailings for the absentees so that will help us so okay. but since the 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 budget year that we're looking at right now i mean i know this isn't a ton of money but the um that election expense that for the this budget, which is going to be 21, fiscal year 21. Is that right? Fiscal year 22. 22. We're in 21. This is 22. Okay. So it'd be July 1st of 21 to June 30th of 22. So fiscal 22 is going to be more similar election wise to fiscal 19. Or sorry, 20. So right? Yeah. Right. Does that make sense? No, yeah. no so national, gonna, no national races. Right. Point. So it should be more yeah. similar to our last actual than to this current budget year, right? Exactly. That's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. So you're thinking like maybe do a thousand then instead. Yeah, of I am. Okay. Yep. Okay. I mean, it does. It it rocks the budget a little bit because that means next um, presidential we'll have to bump it probably, but it's not a huge deal. I think it's usually Alberta reminds us about about that stuff when it's coming up. Yeah, it didn't really make a difference, but um, it did reduce it. Yeah, so so we're up. We have quite an increase in the in this in the town manager's office budget. You just scroll. So yeah. looks like largely driven by health. Health, health insurance, insurance is the biggest driver. Computer software service. Mm -hmm. Well, that's only eighteen hundred compared to twelve thousand. Oh, right. But yeah, I guess it all adds up. But um, yeah. So there are health plan status changes on the health yep. insurance. So yeah, yep. it's just the way it is. <clears throat> and are we saving on copier expenses? because of not having in-person meetings or something? Well, it looks like it stays um, the that's same. That's uh, the copier in our office. Um, right. We actually own it. So um, we have that because the fact that we own it, we don't have any service plan on it and it's kind of old, it's five or six years old, which actually is considered old. Um, so we just have that in case we have to repair it. Um, ah. We just lucked out and didn't have too much maintenance on it in 20. But there's going to be a shift on that line item because, you know, with some of our remote um, activities, you know, we're, we're using some printers at home bases. So you'll see more coming in than 47, you know, bucks. Well, that's previous, oh. excuse me. You're going to see more than that. And as an expense, just given remote office operations. Okay. I just wanted to comment on the health insurance. Yeah, we have some changes, but there's also just the changes for the cost to do the health insurance plans is, you know, Hi, also sweetie. a factor there. Yeah. I just had a quick question about benefits, Casey. 
does our new um, uh, development person, they also receive those benefits or no, because no. they're part-time? Part-time. It's a part-time okay. without benefits, yeah. Okay, any more questions on the, um, the office expenses? I had one more question and I'm, I'm pretty sure that it's would not fall under the office's expenses, but I just wanted to ask. Um, I think it would fall under the general budget, but I'm just curious about um, the, you know, we had a lot of projects come up um, this year, potential projects for connectivity and, and Wi-Fi. And if we had a little chunk of money, um, so that way if there were a project like putting up broadband in East Hardwick, we would be able to jump on it. We're going to get there. We're going to get okay. there in the next one, Kaylee, under That's fire what I thought. So the items. next, the next meeting, Casey? No, the next, no, no, no. The next, the slide. next topic. The next, oh, okay. The next Sorry. File. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Comment. We're getting there. Okay. That's a good segue. Maybe we should jump ahead. Okay. All right. Let's go to fire and line items. Um, so uh, fire department's very flat, $647. We just looked at um, uh, their workers comp and aligned that liability yeah. is pretty spot on I, it worked you know it's it's yep. practically flat looks great dollars so um, I, yep um, then we come down to line items um, and let's see so we did our audit went up a little bit um, this year so it, go, it tends to go up about five hundred dollars a year so since we're looking at 22, I, that's where the thousand dollars comes from because it's from 20, like actual in 22 by the time. We Casey, get to 22. Could, Casey, could you just zoom one click? I'm sorry, I'm running my bifocals okay. and I'm having no trouble problem. seeing the numbers. Oh, Sean, come on. This is so oh. much better than when we're sitting in the room looking across. Yeah. I'm not going to disagree, but I still, it's uh, it's definitely better. I agree with you. We actually talked about that. Uh, how can we, you know, Casey said it's a lot easier to present the budget stuff when we're doing Zoom. Yeah, it is for sure. Well, we could always, if we're in person, we could always do it if everybody had a computer. Uh, we're going to have a, a large screen TV moving forward is the thought process. And everybody, and uh um, you know, special glasses to magnify it. <laughs> um, so, those, All right. yeah. I just want to ask about so auditing. Our last actual was eleven thousand. It looks like the next, the current budget year, and the next one project a single audit in addition. Yes. Is that that's the difference? Correct. That's correct. Yes. Okay. What about okay. the cemeteries? Nineteen thousand dollars to do what? Um, so we give to oh. um, Hardwick Street and Fairview and Sanborn, and it's then mostly there's mowing. A, like a little bit, yeah, most yeah, Sanborn. It's all mowing, um, and then the other two associations um, we give an appropriate we give money to that just all comes out of the cemeteries, okay. and we you know we basically use it all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so I want to kind of all right. So first, this is. So I want to go right to the bottom, show 6.19, um, and I'm sure you can see what the factor, the driving factors are, but um, so we've got a 6.91 increase in the library, which we just talked about, um, the capital road fund, which we covered last meeting, um, and we talked about the fact of the center road project coming up in a few years and the need to increase the capital road fund. Um, we had only been going up about $10,000 a year. And so we are proposing to go to $25,000 increase um, in order to grow that fund to be able to pay for that project. Um, then we have, um, let's see what else. Fire is up because we're gonna continually grow that so we don't have to keep bonding for fire trucks. That's the goal on that. Um, what's the other one? Okay. Um, okay, right. Can I ask one? Here, these two. Really? Go for it. Sure. What What is community crime insurance? I probably asked this before, but I don't remember what it is. Um, well, it's it's on our VLC. I think, uh, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but it's part of our VLCT policy. Um, kind of like a liability. And I think it, 
Yeah, it's some, it's a sort of liability. I, mean, I could get you a, a description, but I, I guess at the moment it's I can't okay. really explain it. It's to okay. You. I remember it being LCP. there. I just yeah. was curious. Yeah. Yeah. So the two things um, here that are new um, is the equity committee, which I'm hoping Kaylee can talk about. Um, they would like the town to um, support them in the new this new fiscal budget. And the other one is 911 signs, which Lucian has kind of been leading. And um, so I will let Kaylee talk about equity committee, um, that amount, and then maybe Lucian can just talk about 911 signs real quick. Yeah, so the equity committee put together this budget based on um, the resolution points about education. Um, so we did research around professional development, both for town staff and select board, but also for community professional development as well. And as you probably know, that varies wildly in cost from $50 an hour to $1,500 for the day, depending on who you hire. Um, so our goal was to have um, to have enough money to support some trainings for um, for the town and to make recommendations for the town, as well as for the community, and then also to be able to support some community events as well. I'm just wondering if it. Um, I know it's a small amount, but you know it's comparable to say the Hardwick Trails, which has a break a broken down budget. I'm wondering um, if it would be useful to have a, you know, just instead of a, a number to also have a little sub, sub budget somewhere for that committee. Um, so, so we know what that's for. Yeah, I think that totally makes sense. Um, yeah, that was a question and this well, that's my fault because I told Kaylee that she didn't need to provide that because it wouldn't have as many categories. It doesn't have um, salaries or anything like that. So I told her that she didn't need to do that. So that's my fault then. But it well, would be pretty simple to put together, Casey. I'm ha yeah. happy to do it. And, um, you know, I could also just talk to the committee about, um, you know, obviously it's, it's a new, it's new. So in that process, if it ends up being a little bit lower, then I will keep you posted. So is there a deadline that I would need to provide that by? Um, that's a good question, actually, because we don't really know. So the deadline is when the select board finalizes the budget, which is typically um, sometime, we need to do it typically by sometime in January. And it, the date varies a little bit because it's you back it up from town meeting day. And um, there's a day that the, the, the town meeting needs to be warned and um, we need enough time before that to get things out to the printer and sent out to people. So, and then this year, of course, um, it may be virtual. I don't know, that probably doesn't affect, even if it's virtual, it doesn't affect the- um, The annual report gets, uh, right. so it would get, in, it would get uh, a page or a half page or whatever, just like the trails does and the other budgets. So, but the, the deadline will be, whenever we decide that we're done with the budget. Well, I think so that, sooner than later, yeah. Yeah. I think the equity committee has a meeting, has a meeting early next month, right? So it'd be in the next couple of weeks or something. So yeah. maybe you could plan for the December 17th meeting, if that works. Yeah, I will have that prepared for the December 17th meeting. Okay, Great. perfect. Eric, uh, can I just comment on the, uh, like the, t the timing of things? I think uh, if I have this right, there's a January 7th meeting holding the regular schedule. The next meeting would be the 21st. If the pattern holds, January 21st is too late for the board to be approving things to get it ready for the town report. This is assuming there's no significant changes in the process this year. Right, so there's just, probably going to have to be yeah, a special meeting. Yeah, either on the 7th yeah. or another special meeting that next week. Okay, there we go. For, I, that's my it's thought not, right now. It's not uncommon to have to have a special meeting to get the budget done. No? Right, right. It's not uncommon, know. but if we can avoid it. Well, sure. Yeah, if you could get it done for January 7th, that'd be great. My memory is that we've gotten it done before Christmas the last few years. We have, we definitely have on some yeah. years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Last year we did it like the 17th or something like that. So we, we wouldn't 
with the with kind of the later date. I'm so. not sure this is where I should raise the issue I wanted to raise two weeks ago, which is that that there have been talking, we've been talking about trailheads through the village at the uh, depot, at the Memorial Park, at um, the Yellow Barn. Yeah. And, you know, the possibility of the town putting at least a bike rack and a picnic table at each of those points and perhaps some sort of comfort facilities. Um, and, and I don't know if that's going to be an ongoing expense and should be part of the town budget, but it sort of feels like a rail trail, not a rail trail, but the, the Hardwick Trails is a committee. It has a full budget, but um, I think it would be good for us to consider putting something in the budget so that we could make those trailhead sites look at least friendly. So I think you're absolutely right. But I also think we need to be mindful that we have, uh, have quite a generous grant from USDA that we were going to use to actually build part of the LVRT. Oh, but okay. now the state is going to be building the LVRT. And so um, USDA has said, basically, go ahead and plan out what you want to do in your town related to that trail. And they'll, you know, they'll support us, it sounds like. So perfect yeah so i think that that's funding for those things and we yeah. just need to okay. figure out how to direct it and there are a bunch of all the things that you just named plus you know do we should we make a bike lane going from the memorial park downtown should we do the e-bike charging station at it's somewhere downtown I, you know kaylee wants one come on you have a motorcycle um <laughs> so uh bathroom facilities <laughs> yeah all those things so this is stuff watering that we, station yeah yes all those things so we really ought to map this out um yeah well i'll um i'm gonna try to get a little in the coming months i'm gonna try and to we get don't a little need bit. to spend time now no but i'll try Let's to get more resolution on the timeline of the trail getting built and then that can drive how we figure out you know the amenity thing but it's i don't one think I need to add it for sorry it. eric go ahead yeah good no go ahead all i was going to say is uh just in regards to uh once the trail is done v trans does assume the maintenance of the trail so everybody just needs to be informed of that we don't need to be budgeting for maintenance of the trail you know whatever it is upkeep mowing brush cutting whatever that's going to be v trans's responsibility but if we create trail ancillary services on That's our ours. own, then we'll have to maintain those. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That's correct. All right. So this budget is definitely big. I mean, this is those line items are a, a lot, right? There's a million bucks and it went up 6%. That's going to be a pretty big driver overall. Mm -hmm. um, and the biggest driver in there is the capital road fund, I right. think. Yeah, almost. Yeah, thirteen percent, and then these two new things here. So the nine one one signs, briefly. Um, so that was a project that Lucian had kind of started working on, and the thought was to try to do that over spread it out over three years. Is that correct, Lucian? Yeah, it might be as much as four years. Do you want to step um, in? When I did the calculations, I did it in the spring and and um and, and we talked about it at the select board meeting and I, I had a whole handout with the math on it and stuff. Yep. And um yeah, that was just the idea was to stretch it over over three or four years. It'll depend somewhat on how many people want actually want the signs and it depends on like who wants posts and who who's just going to have a sign and you know so it's a little bit hard to predict exactly how many years but it looked like it was going to be i think it was nine to twelve thousand dollars was my my number in the spring and so that was the idea and just to just as a reminder that the um this all came from uh emergency police and rescue and fire sometimes having trouble they get called out to a 911 address but it's not always not everybody has a number on their house, or if they do, sometimes their house isn't visible from the road. So this is to get a uniform 
um, sign system out so that um, emergency services can find uh, people when they need services. Right, and there are different options for doing it. And um, so we chose an option where, which is one of the, the, the least expensive ways to do it was that we would, the town would provide basically the, the, the signs and whatever needed to have the, the um, signs and the posts and stuff, but the people would actually be putting them up themselves and it'd be, it'd be voluntary. Um, you know, as opposed to some towns took and, and, um, and just provided signs and posts and put them in every driveway. And that was, was you know, at least two or three times as expensive um, as this option. So, so this and some towns, some towns have them just, you're there, the signs are available for purchase at the town clerks. So right. we're kind of in the middle. Right, right? exactly. Put the middle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Because we thought, we thought by doing, by at least, providing the signs, um, then it would it would reduce a barrier to people putting them up, right? Yeah, so there'd be more uptake on them actually getting put out, which the you know the, the emergency services people thought was a, a good thing to put the money towards. Right. Yep. Okay. So I mean I, I unless people have more questions on this, I think we're just gonna have to mull it over and see what it looks like on the overall and so then let's come back. get to the all right let's get to it then um all right so revenue um let's talk about the big changes so greensboro police contract um the reason for the change well we're still negotiating i don't know if you want to talk about this sean but um it's basically a percentage of the police budget. So yeah, it's um, historically been 24%. the last time the contract was done. Correct. So when we factor that number in, this is what it looks like. Um, the last contract that we did was back in 17. So it was done for 18, 19, 20, or some, yeah, or maybe it was 19, 20, 21, it was three years. And the amounts were laid out each year. Um, based on projections, but um, we're, we're just looking at at least the first year at this time at the 24%. And then I think we're going to probably be taking it year by year um, and working with them that way. So based on what we've presented for a police budget, that's, that's the number, that's the 24%. So, yeah, and we're just to be clear with everybody, we're still just negotiating at this point with yes. the Greensboro officials. So that's, you know, we cannot consider that to be our final at this phase. Mm -hmm. Yep. Understood. Um, water and sewer transfers, that's all formula based. Basically, you take, um, I have a formulas where it's a percentage, it's basically 10% of salaries and benefits for highway and office. And so that's, that's the formula. And because we had increases in salaries and benefit costs, that's what it's going up. So, um, and so right now we're at 3.27 without making any further changes. So um, I, I think we do have some space to, to work with we have some some areas we might be able to reduce and try to get that down, but this is this is the first run through. I do not have recreations budget, but I do have them plugged in as being flat. Just because if we go back here, their actual was like nineteen. Um, I made them with no increase, so that that's a potential. I expect to have that for the next meeting, and that I think we've been through all the departments other than other than recreation, but I do have a figure in there for them. So this is where it stands as of right now. Wasn't there a percentage that somebody calculated that we were trying to aim at in other years? Usually, we we like to see the. Um, I like to see it less than three percent, mm -hmm. uh, just in general, and that's you know, and that's just an idea that that over time, um, some costs just go up. There's an increased cost of living, and also most of our labor contracts where we have contracts are close to a three percent increase year over year, so since labor is our driving force for most of our budget, 
either the labor or the ancillary things related to labor. Um, we try to limit it to that or keep it under. Um, in this case, having the uh, revenues increase so slightly looks like that's pushing us toward a bigger tax increase um, or at least sorry so a bigger yeah a bigger jump in the total amount that needs to be raised through property taxes now the amount that that affects anybody individually is going to be depend on our grand list and I don't know if we have any projections at this stage. I mean, it's always, honestly, it's always just a total guess about what our grand list is going to do. Because never have the grand list until after, yeah. After we're in the, the budget year, right? Or something. I mean, right. it's, yeah. it's finalized. Like, no, I, or something. well, I, no, I would have, I, I have that. Um, I, well, I don't know how soon I'll have it, but I usually have it before I produce the town report because that figure is going to go right here. Um, so yep. I'll get that from but Alberta. We don't have right, the education but, side though. Right. No, we, well, that's no, not but, ever, in just, it, but, but right, even that, the grand list. but even that is just a total guess that grand list yeah. estimated. From Alberta. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's a total wag. We have no idea really. It doesn't get finalized till much later after so we've already done the budget. I have one really? question about restorative justice. Did we, was that totally grant funded or was there any? Um, it that, was grant funded. Um, yeah, so we it did just, give 3,000, we did give an appropriation, which, um, yeah, which, so the, just the which goes away. But, but um, so we didn't, yeah. So, and we just gave office space. That's what the town contributed. Is that how we matched it or something? So there was never a line item for restorative justice for- There was not a line no, just item. just the appropriation. But we did yeah. give an appropriation. So that would have, if that if they needed that for a match, that would have helped, I'm sure. Right. And you're right, the office space. I just had two quick questions. Yeah. One, which I brought up earlier, just in the wrong spot. Um, but it, it seems like it would, be, and I'm, I'm new to the budget process, so I don't know how to do this or where it would go, but it does seem like um, if we were able to have either to add a little bit, maybe a thousand dollars or add the description of public Wi-Fi, um, whether that's under maintenance or infrastructure, but it seems like to Wiz's point earlier, um, that's going to become more and more relevant and important for the town. And um, I don't know where that falls, but I think there are going to be some opportunities um, in the next year or two to, if, if we had some money designated to that, then we could maybe make decisions um, like putting, putting up Wi-Fi in East Hardwick or putting up Wi-Fi in downtown in, in an easier way. So I'm not sure if this is the time to talk about that or to bring it up. Um, this is the time. Okay. Um, uh, Sherry, could Sher Sherry, could you maybe comment a little bit because you just went well, through this at the townhouse? Maybe Sean can help me with it. But um, when the townhouse got that Wi-Fi uh, um, spot uh, installed up there, it's outside on the outside of the building, so it's totally public Wi-Fi. The guy whose name I don't remember at this time, who was from. Uh, uh, Rutland, no, Bethel. Um, Sean, do you remember? He talked about how they're, um, they're, um, they're in the process. He is in the process with the state of developing this uh, further reach for this Wi-Fi program. Um, and if, if I remember right, it's like we get it for free for two or three years and then there'll be some place where where we'll have to kind of like the Eve Vermont community broadband thing where after a couple of years they started to want us to pay for some services related to it um but it was really help he was really um 
positive that it was going to expand even more than it has. And we asked him about East Hardwick and he said, absolutely, it's going to, you know, so it was, um, it was really positive exchange. I don't know the specifics of it, but it seems like we might be able to skate by for another year or so. That's all I know. Yeah. One of the details that I recall was um, with the, the, the independent contractor. So one of the things he talked about was if you picked up the tower, say coming off the rec trail, uh, you know, at this location near the historic depot and townhouse, if you build out this umbrella network, the whole intent is if somebody is using their phone and just as an example, if they have a map running on their phone, uh, they could be on the Wi-Fi network, and as they're moving through the village area, they would maintain that Wi-Fi so access, seamless, yeah. not have to pick up a new tower, if I could say it that way. So and it's just kind of like this seamless network that is trying to be established. That the state is actually doing. They're behind it at this point. Yeah. One of the things I'm trying to figure out, just for uh, the good of the conversation, is uh, I'm just trying to figure out, yeah, it's important that we would be investing in this as a community, but I'm trying to make sure this doesn't imply, okay, we're creating another uh, utility branch of operations. The point being, we're not the, you know, currently, obviously, we don't have the staff personnel expertise to be running, uh, you know, a, a Wi-Fi network. So I, I assume that's not the root of the discussion. It's more about just reinforcing these investments so folks have a way to connect. Doug, you wanted to chime in? Yeah, uh, I'm speaking here as a representative of the CUD, and I know that one town in particular was given a free option for Wi-Fi, and then after, I think, a year or two, the amount turned out to be insane, and that had nothing to do with hardware, it had to do with software. Um, so I think that would be something to consider, is to make sure that when you sign the dotted line for a free agreement, that it actually is for hardware, not for software. So buyer beware. So if I'm if I'm hearing this right, I'm hearing that there's grant money available now and in the near future for this. So we probably don't need an uh, an item for it. Is that what I'm hearing? That's what I'm hearing. That was the impression I was given by the guy who is the who's working with the state to do this thing. Um, and it's not a Hardwick thing. It's a Vermont thing. And so if there were a project that required like a, a match for per se or something on our part, then that would just come before the select board to decide at a future date, knowing, <laughs> actually right. knowing what's before us, if we need to. So it's it's kind of like um, having some idea of what that cost would right. be. Yeah. So, but it wasn't the NECARS didn't have to write a check to get no, this. And no, 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 no. Uh -uh. No, it was the thing. It was actually um, NVDA sent out the notice for application right. to this thing, and it was it, there was no cost related. They were just trying to help uh, public Wi-Fi be more accessible, and so I filled it out. I filled out the application as as the townhouse and the depot, and um, and they you know and they put it in. <laughs> it's a beautiful so thing. Yeah. This is this is Paul Fix. Can you hear me? We yeah. can, Paul. Good. Um, so this is something that um, Kaylee brought up with me, and I guess it's a follow-on to my conversation when I brought up the CUD that I see there's a gap between what the CUD provides and what the town might want to have in place to meet the needs of people in the town. And in this case, uh, I'm glad to hear there's no additional cost. Um, I think Sherry, at the very least, NEK Arts is still going to have to pay for your internet connection. We pay for the internet connection inside the building and it's a private, it's our connection. It's a business thing with Comcast and we're fine doing that. But this right, is an so outside so that it's actually really uh, more functional than um, them having the password to our inside uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, understood, uh, but without the NEK Arts support of the 
internet connection inside the building, there would be no connection outside the building. So there is some They're separate things. They're separate things, Paul. This was the completely separate thing. We already so had the internet connection at the time. I, I understand. Yeah. And if you cancel that internet connection tomorrow, the outside Wi-Fi would or would not have a connection. It would have a connection because it's separate. So they paid for your connection to Comcast, or they that have a program. Interesting. It. That seemed different than what we were being told. Well, that's great. Yeah. So my point in in bringing this up and if putting a thousand dollars in the budget isn't the right thing to do what concerned me was when this opportunity arose there didn't seem to be someone within town government with a, a mandate charge interest in pursuing it and so if the thousand dollars isn't the right way to do it, and I, I think tonight we heard Sean say we don't have the expertise, et cetera, and that's probably true. So when you don't have the expertise with a wastewater situation, you, you write a contract for $50,000 for someone to study it and make a recommendation. So whatever, whether money needs to be in the budget or not, I think somehow the town needs to be aware of these things and somehow help move opportunities forward. So that's, so I that's think, really so, all I have to say. I think though, Paul, that this in this example, we were made aware of it by NVDA. Sherry Cornish took the initiative and got it hooked up at the townhouse and we got an additional Wi-Fi spot in town. Right, so now I'm hearing that that Wi-Fi spot had no cost, no ongoing cost. And I'll bet had that had somebody reached out to the people at the state the way Sherry did for NEK Arts on behalf of the East Hardwick opportunity, we might now have an East Hardwick. And maybe we still could. Um, it's if possible. Really... I can try to find out. I can, uh, Sean has the contact information for that gentleman, and I do too. I just have to dig around in my messages to find it. but. You know, how about I check on that and see whether it's still out there. He gave us the impression that it was going to be continuing and there would be more opportunities. That's great. Yeah. So I think that's that's the point I'm making, Eric, is that 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 and I'm glad it now seems that's possible. So I, I hope that in future, the select board and town manager's office um, you know, at least figure out some method to pursue these kind of opportunities. Yeah, yeah, and just, yeah, for me to understand, um, I'm trying to also, you, you got to just help me out here, the uh, NEK communication district, uh, I mean, my understanding when this thing got rolling is the intent is the communication union district would be providing some support on these matters as well. And you guys have definitely been for, informing us of opportunities, but uh, I guess what I'm getting to is we can't overnight uh, just be shifting our focus. Um, you know, obviously we want to make sure we've got this as a service opportunity for citizens, but it, it takes a little time to work these things in. If I could just say that. No, I absolutely understand. So, you know, by bringing it up, uh, you know, I, I hope that's happening. And I, you know, I had no view of what the town knew or what the CUD knew before I got appointed to the board. But as I see what the CUD and the board of the CUD are doing. Um, our goal is first achieving uh, internet connections for unserved locations and improving connections at underserved locations. So I, it's not, I don't think, I'm sure it's not about public Wi-Fi opportunities or internet opportunities, uh, you know, directly because the CUD has been keyed into information and these processes as a result of the CARES Act and COVID funding. Um, we've certainly been passing those things, you know, they've been passing it to reps to pass to towns. And, you know, to some extent, especially now that we have some paid professional leadership, we can provide support on that. But what I'm finding now today is that what we were being told is not what Sherry found. So I'm 
questioning the accuracy of some of the information I'm hearing from the CUD leadership about that particular opportunity. So I, again, I think the town needs to at least be cognizant of you know when opportunities present itself. And I, I don't know what the best way to pursue that is, but it, it's a new thing. It's a new all thing right. we, all, we all have to learn about. And I, yeah, I don't mean, yeah. it's a, lo it's and, a long meeting. I don't need to belabor it yeah. tonight. I, Thanks. I'm not, I'm Thanks, not married. Kyle. I'm not I, married to having a thousand dollars in the budget. I, I don't know how Kaylee feels at this time, but. So um, I, thanks, Paul. I mean, I think that we, I, the only comment I would make on um, the ground that you just covered is that I think it is a little different than um, like a wastewater facility, which I think we consider an essential service for, for our village. And I don't think that right now we consider public Wi-Fi a, an essential service in the same way as um, water and wastewater, but that could change in the future. Um, you know, certainly in, in, you know, sometime around 1900, the town decided that, that, uh, or the village decided that they wanted to have electricity and they moved to make that happen. So stranger things have happened. Um, so it seems to me that this might be something that the, the new position could possibly be part of. Yeah. There you go. I think that the list is really long, Lucian, for the things that the community development coordinator could take a look at to try to get funding for. I think I mentioned four or five things to Sean the other day when he said, <laughs> he's talking about it. I just wanted to say for the record that I'm not married to adding $1,000 to the budget. This is my first time in the budget, so I'm not exactly sure how to do it. I just want to make sure that, to Paul's point, that we're nimble enough to make decisions as they arrive. Um, which I know that we are. So I just wasn't sure if we had a little pot of money that it would make it easier for us to make decisions next year if we if we did have a project or a grant that came across. But um, if but we'll be able to figure it out no matter what. That was kind of the impetus of of asking about it. Well, I thank you for bringing it up. It definitely is the time to bring it up because it's the time to when we need to put things in the budget. This is the time is now. Um, I, I actually. Though I have to say that looking at the budget, my concern is not adding to it, but subtracting from it. Um, <laughs> so, which is always harder. Um, all right. If so, everybody good on the budget as Casey presented for now as just information and does anybody have more questions for Casey on the budget? Casey, I forgot to ask you, what do you have left for, what do we have left for departments? Just recreation. Um, I believe that's it. So we can do our second run through at the meeting on the 17th and just see how we can um, have the select board can uh, we're, we're go, right? be able to make any cuts. First cut has been done. Yeah. And if it would be helpful if Alberta has, um, wants to make her, you know, look into her crystal ball and make her projections for what the grand list might look like next year. Okay. Even though we know that's just a guess. Sometimes it's a guess based on knowing what's been built and what's planning to be built. All right. Thank you, Casey. Sure. Thank you. Have a good night. I'm gonna sign off. Thanks, Casey. Uh, have a good night. Thanks. Good night. All Guys, right. So thank next you for up, asking you another question. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so we just got the update about the swing bridge. Just so I understand, would that oh, be yeah. would that be included in this budget, or are we just assuming that we don't have enough information and that we like do we just bond for it at a later date? Do we include it in this budget? Do we or do we build up to it? I'm just curious where that where that goes. That's a great question. I think that that's um a pressing issue it is something we're hoping to pay for um within a year somehow um i think we're hopeful that there might be some grant money available to help us with that um and also hopeful that our new de um, development coordinator person can help help with that sean uh, you wanna... yeah i can comment so what i'm looking at is uh i'm investigating uh, right now usda uh rural business enterprise grants 
uh, and then also uh, if we can couple it with community facilities grant potentially, and then also looking at um, uh, what might be out there for uh, preservation trust opportunity. So uh, there's some grant there, but um, you know, in the end, there's going to have to be some local match. So I, I don't have, uh, you know, the crystal ball to know how this all would break down and what we might see. We know it's a significant cost. So it's nothing that uh, my observation is if we're going after replacement, it's not something you could budget for and, you know, the line items, it's just going to be too much. It's something that we could um, potentially pull from uh, like a roads capital we have bridge um, nope. fund now so there is some money yep. in the capital bridge fund uh let's not forget you know here we are talking about the pedestrian bridge but we have a need for a new public highway garage we have some significant repairs that need to be produced uh, done on um, uh, memorial building roof as well as we're going to be bidding public safety roof and historic depot roof and we do have some money set aside for those uh the last two projects i've noted but it's really tricky to know what the commodity pricing is going to be. So uh, just some uncertainty on, you know, what's the best number to apply to some of these things, right? That's, that's yeah. It. I mean, I would say um, if people wanted to think about a really, for the back to the swinging bridge, if you wanted to think about like a minimum amount that, that the town might have to contribute, if so are the recent estimate uh, or sorry, assessment at a rough back of the napkin estimate of about $300,000 to replace that bridge. Most federal funding or most grants won't allow federal funding in excess of 80%, which would mean that if the source was ultimately federal, then um, you know, for any combination of grants we were able to get, we'd still need to produce about 60,000 in local match. Well, and that said, um, wouldn't the next step be um, a design if we, yeah, at the point when we choose to um, replace it? Because that seems like that's the recommendation. And if that's the case, then those, whatever we spent on design, um, would uh, end up being able to be used as in kind, no? Depends on the grant. So sometimes if it's soft, soft costs that you've already spent, it's not eligible. So I discussed um, that uh, a tactic with our um, USDA contact on Tuesday and asked of her, um, we've had this, uh, we've actually had two engineering firms look at it. We have this most recent report uh, be uh, through the Preservation Trust uh, grant for design. And what was relayed to me is um, the information we got out of the Preservation Trust report while not a full-blown design is enough for us to move forward with a um, our bag or community facilities grant application. The point is that we don't necessarily at this stage have to engage with engineering services. We can be going after the grant. And then if we were to get it, then that helps to cover those costs moving forward, if that, if that makes sense. You know, I know this is an unpopular thing to say, but um, I think we should, Think about how how much we want to spend on 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 a bridge that bridge, because I feel like it's um and I think the bridge is awesome and I I I you know, wish we had all the money in the world to just make another one just like it but um, to me it just seems like a really lot of money and it's um it's super handy it's a super great feature in town but it's not um, entirely necessary and so um I don't know yeah. if it might make yeah. sense to have more. <laughs> Uh, community input into how much money that we want to put into it because um, i'm just concerned you know as 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 we've been hearing we have we have a whole ton of other infrastructure expenses that we really can't get out of and this is i feel like there's some flex in this as I'm, as much as i wish there wasn't um so i guess i feel like we need a lot of grant funding for me to feel comfortable just jumping on this is and um, and as 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 like I say, as unpopular as I know it is, we might want to just get a quick um, engineer or somebody's assessment for what it would cost to just take it out because that's that that's also a cost that we should factor in if if that is a choice that people want to do. There, just for the good of the conversation, um, in the in the report that we got from Engineering Ventures, 
they did say it, it, it's not a preferred approach, but you could consider a rehab and that's significantly less cost, but it doesn't, you know, it doesn't build you out for 25, 50 or 75 years. You know, it gets you three to five years. Just so everybody's aware, you know, you got a rehab tactic that's more affordable. You got you to gotta run your return on investment though. And, you know, is that, is that how you want to go? Just, just so everybody is aware. Yeah. Is, that was, is there room, Sean, to add it. this to the next meeting or the, it feels like it should be an item, like a proper yeah. discussion yeah, yeah. item. And then also include, we got the information pretty late from, I mean, it was great. It was great information that you sent, but I would love to like dedicate some time specifically to this swinging bridge if we have room in our next yeah, meeting or the yeah. meeting after absolutely i mean i would respectfully request that i mean we got to start uh, lining these things up and we are way behind the curve on our public works garage i'm just saying it we got to do something about that yeah in that way yes so i think we should table it for now is my two cents eric and we can pick this up at the next meeting yeah that's what kaylee's suggesting i like it Let's put it on the agenda for next time. We'll discuss the bridge. Yay. All right. Moving on. Um, next is uh, item four, which is follow-up discussion about River Street. Um, and I, um, I see it looks like we have Rachel and we have Tracy still with us. Um, long haulers tonight. Um, so uh, I just, let's see, um, at our last meeting, I said that I would uh, try to do a little more research into uh, that where the town stands on, um, on an interest in, in River Street. And I did do a little more research. Um, I, I spent a number of hours on it. Uh, I sent a summary to the select board, uh, spoke to various folks about it, including Wiz. Um, and uh, basically my conclusion, the short, the short conclusion is that if we want to have some sort of definitive answer, we're gonna need to either hire a lawyer to do re deed research or we hire a surveyor to do a survey. I'm not totally sure what's the, which, which, which of those is preferable. Um, and I guess I would also note that from my research, uh, I think it's a little different. Like in the past, we've done surveys of, of roads where there have been disputes. Like we did one on Buffalo Mountain Trail and we did one on the, that old Pent Road out in Macville. I believe in both those cases, we had very good reason to believe that those had been town roads in the past. I think in this case, we don't have anything quite as definitive. So it's a little more of a um, shot in the dark, I guess. That's my preamble. Come on, somebody. Uh, I'm, okay? uh, I'm uh, yeah, I think we should have it surveyed. I think it would be a good thing to do. Uh, I agree with such a gray uh, area. So I'd be happy to make a motion that we take a look at surveying that road or. So, okay. So take a look at meaning um, ask the town, town manager to um, contact, well, Lisa Gannett's done a bunch of work for us from Sunwise and she's always been good to work with and just run it by her and see, is this something that she would take on and, and what it would cost and what, would the product look like? Yes. Can I just, uh, sorry, there'll be time. I, I got a question when we get to discussion. <clears throat> Wiz, was that a second? That's a second. Yeah, I, I think if you, if you hire a lawyer, you'll get a document full of words. If you hire a surveyor, you'll get a map you'll get something that's visual that people can look at and, and either, you know, it, it's just more comprehensible. And she does good work. So one thing I wanted to mention is that um, mill sites are, are super, can, tend to be super complicated as we're figuring out. 
And from I know from talking to surveyors that they um, they say they're some of the most complicated places to survey, and that sometimes they, they can put a lot of time in and not come up with anything. But it's not, not a mill site, Lucian. It's the road. It's the yeah. right of way to get to the mill site. There but, are two different things there. I don't think they're necessarily different. I think they're pretty tightly intertwined in this case. Okay. Right, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a village. And I, I'm not against it. And, and I think um, Tracy said last time that I think, I think public property should have public access. And I feel very strongly that that's, that's true. Um, I'm just saying that maybe we should try and take this in a, in a multiple step. And I, I think uh, maybe Eric said, um, talk to a surveyor and try to figure out what, like how deep we want to get into this thing before we dive completely in. That would be only my, my piece. Your caveat. My caveat, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Tracy, did you want to say something? So, um, I again, I think we have a tendency to sort of muddle things together. So, if if we're going to hire a surveyor, it's important to know what they'd be surveying. In my personal opinion, the properties under the right of way are irrelevant. It doesn't matter to the town who owns those properties. <laughs> if the property owners want to survey them. That's their business. To me, the right of way is the importance. Right of ways cross over properties. Um, so it's, the, it's whether there's a public right of way over those properties and the, whether that public right of way was ever considered to be a street. Th those are the questions. I don't think a survey of the property is gonna get us anywhere as far as that public right of way. And to that point, Eric, remember you found that wonderful um, essay by Mr. Gillies? Yeah. And you forwarded that to us. Um, so I found another little thing that he wrote called The Public Right of Way and You. <laughs> oh, nice. And can I write, read just a couple sentences from that? Because he it's says- really just a couple. Is it something you could forward to us so that we could read it? Is it- I could, but I really, really want to read just a couple sentences. Okay. I think it helps say it clearer than I can say it. Carry on. Okay. So he's talking about the landowners that own the land under a right of way. Okay. And he says, within the public right of way, landowners have few rights. If the town ever discontinues the right of way, as a landowner, you'll recover full title to the land you own. Another, the, your land that was under the right of way, you get back if the town throws up the road. Um, uh, while the right of way is in force, your rights are not much different from that of the traveling public. You can't forbid someone from traveling over the road. You can't place obstructions on the highway. You can't exercise any dominion over the land. So what's happening, I think, on River Street is that a landowner is trying to assert what he thinks are his rights to the land under what I believe is still a publicly owned right of way. I don't actually think he owns the land under that right of way, but that's almost irrelevant because whether or not he does, if there's still a public right of way in place, that's all the town really needs to worry about. The landowners, I feel like they can do their own surveys if they want to. Uh-oh, my battery's running out. Um, uh, and then the last thing I wanted to read from this, the public right of way is a resilient legal idea that often has little to do with what happens on the ground. Um, even, if a high, uh, even if a highway were laid out but never built on, the roadbed abandoned long ago due to disuse, the right of way still remains until the town formally gives it up, usually by legal process involving a notice, hearing, inspection, and everything. So once a light right of way is owned by a town, it's owned by a town until the town formally gives it up. And I think we found evidence that that right of way is owned by the town. Um, so uh, I don't think it matters who owns the land under it if the town still owns the right of way. That's so I guess I, so. Um, I would say a couple things. One is uh, I believe that the town can own a right own a right of way that is not right not a public right of way. That's so probably think, true, but I don't think this is one of those, but I think that's probably true. So I think that uh, there's an argument to be made that this is not, if it, if it were, a pub, if it were, uh, if the town owned a right of way, it might not necessarily be a public right of way because 
these properties. I don't think were, a post office would have been hang built. Hang on a second. Okay. Hang on a second. Okay. Um, I think because um, the properties that if if we're talking about just the 1929 acquisition of properties and the associated rights of way that was all done for the electric department the electric depart the electric department certainly could have rights of way into places that were not ever intended to be public rights of way further um, in in my limited deed research i was not able to find a description of the right of way referenced in those gristmill deeds so there is just right of rights, any rights of way is thrown out in a long litany of rights that are conveyed or not conveyed. Further, there was um, also a right of way um, transferred when the village brought the sawmill property, not the gristmill property, for the electric department. That right of way is very specific. It is that's not very specific in exactly where it is to me, although it does have a general description, but it's very specific in what it's for. So that the village actually acquired a right of way to the sawmill for the purpose of moving logs or wood or machinery in and out of the sawmill. So I think just to illustrate the point that not all rights of way owned by a municipality are public rights of way. Anyway, that all being what it is, um, it's still possible to hire someone to try to sort this out. Kaylee? I just, I have a, a question that I think, Tracy, you're right. I think, I think it's, there are so many details that sometimes it's really muddying to, and I think we've talked about, this has come up at the past few meetings. We've gotten a lot of different opinions about it. And almost every select board member has done their own research and, and brought it back, which is really cool to watch, like just how invested everybody is in this topic. I guess my question is, what would it take the town to make this one section of road accessible and safe for the, those two properties to park at their properties, which is a different question than what's a public right of way and what's not, what are we willing to do to make sure that that, that happens? And if it's not our responsibility to do it, um, then it's not, but it seems like it is. And so that is a different question to me than who owns it or who, um, maybe if we, reframe, if we reframe the question, I know that sounds like starting over, <laughs> but don't worry. But if we reframe it in a way that is, this is the past that we know, either we can invest money in surveying and hiring lawyers, or we can work towards a future and figure out what that looks like. Um, and I obviously am a newbie to this, so maybe it's not that simple, um, but it's a very, very small section of road that we're talking about. Um, it's not including the chunk of land. It's, what is it, Tracy? It's like 50 feet, 75. It's so small um, to the end of, really just the end of the lockers. So it could be, I, I mean, I'm just wondering if it would be advantageous to kind of reframe it to be less, and maybe that's too simple, but. Um. So sometimes with, um, with surveying, even though it's, I mean, so I, I, I drug around equipment for a surveyor for a couple of years, so I don't know anything, but just from talking with them, um, the smallness of the lot doesn't necessarily mean much. Sometimes we'd survey huge acres that were very clear and we just run around and be a great day in the woods. And sometimes we'd be in this little tiny lot and he'd be doing deed research for weeks and couldn't maybe ever really quite be positive where the boundaries were. So just, just one point on that. Tracy. So a couple things in response. Um, I like Kaylee's approach, but I also wanted to say having studied that part of town now more than I ever cared to, and I hope I never have to think about it ever again. Um, if you just look at the topography, where the historic buildings have been, the possible rights of way that they could have been referring to, considering that Mill Street already existed at the time that that deed was <laughs> written. There aren't many other possible rights of way. The one that you're talking about, Eric, I believe came down from Pleasant Street, and I think is the way that um, Norm's family used to actually access their property. 
was down uh, Cedar. there, Cedar Street, sorry, Cedar Street. There used to be, and I think there might still be uh, a road that came down from there. And I think that was the road that accessed the uh, sawmill. Um, but considering there was already a house and several businesses on Mill Street, um, I don't think the town would have acquired it intending in nobody to be able to drive down it. I, I just don't believe that's true. Mill Street was on the map for over 50 years before this right of way was, you know, transferred in that deed. I just don't see where any other rights of way other than those two could possibly have been given the other structures that were on the property and the topography and the river. So the- I think I, we're being yeah. willfully, uh, to say that Mill Street was not one of those rights of way, I think is not possible. So, yeah, so it sure could be, which would definitely beg the question, um, if it were a town road, why would you need a right of way? That's just how they described it. Why are you saying that? Because it's actually conveyed in a deed, a right of way. If you had a right of, why would you need a like I don't. It have wasn't a, right a town road until I, that's what I'm saying. Until it oh. was conveyed in the deed, I believe the road was probably constructed by the mill owner, and then businesses grew up around it, and okay. he con and then it was conveyed to the town. I don't believe it was a town road until it was conveyed in that deed. I believe it was built by a business owner, and development happened around it. And then when that deed was conveyed, that's when the town accepted it. That's so, my that's my take on it. I can't swear yeah. to that, but that's my that seems to so, make the most sense. So I agree that I mean I understand that that you read these things and that makes the most sense to you. I guess my point is that there are a lot of deeds to sift through, and it's not at least to me and my re reading of it, it's not, it doesn't come through as clearly as it does to you. And so that's why I'm saying that if we want to um, figure this out, I don't think we can just rely on me or you. I think we need to hire somebody to do it. That's fine. That's up to you guys. Can sure. I just say something here? Um, uh, Davies stated last meeting that there was a historical use and that historical use of parking took precedent over everything else, as I recall. He seemed to indicate that that was important. And I don't know if anybody's investigated that, but he said that because cars have been parked there for 14 years, that took precedent. Not parking, it was traveled, used as a traveled way by the It was also parked on area. for years. The, the customers lockers. of the meat lockers parked diagonally right in front of that building all along that street. For years. Eric, I have a logistics question. Yeah. I'm just, um, I, I want to see this advance and sort it out to be clear. I know a lot of us have put energy into this. Um, what I'm curious about is I'm not sure that we could even ha hire a surveyor. This effectively is private property. It's not the town's property. I don't even know if that's, we can do this. Well, we, yeah, so that's I'm not why saying don't do it. I just would have to verify that with if you if the motion proceeds where you ask me to you know entertain uh, talk to a surveyor, we'll just ask the question of them. But it's just something I'm thinking about. I, yeah, I'm so coming from a surveying background, and I just don't know if you can go and just randomly go start surveying somebody else's property. And that's I don't mean to be flip, but it's like that. Yeah, so that I thought of the same thing, and that's why I thought that we should not try to say you know, direct you to go hire a surveyor, but direct you to go talk to a surveyor. Yeah, because they do need the research question. as well, of course. Yeah, and ask the question. And I think the question, it, the way to pose it is that that we think we might, that we think the town might have an interest in Mill Street or River Street. And we think that might be a right of way. We don't think the town owns any property there now. Yeah, I understood. That's all I wanted to say. But you're right. I mean, the same thing occurred to me. And then, um, so to, to Kaylee's point about could we just, um, you know, would it be uh, feasible or practical to just start and, you know, to lay out a new road? But I think that um, if we made some effort to uncover the past first, that would not be wasted effort because I think if we came to a point where it was uh, decided to be worthwhile and possible to lay out a road, um, we would have to know who owns the property underneath and what the, you know, what the situation on the ground is because those people would, anybody who owned anything there would have to be compensated. 
If if I, I if I may, and this is just a background. This is Dave. Um, hi, um, Dave Gross. If for technical purposes, um, I did work on a survey crew for two years. Plus, I have a mapping background. Plus, I did do some research going back on the grist mill. Though I was limited to one hour, going back through and looking at the um, um, titles backing it up. Um, there are some descriptions in associated with the grist mill property transfers that give out some dimensions of things that the surveyor might find useful um, that um, I did not plot out and some of them they're not they're somewhat vague. In other words, they don't have a true bearing. They're saying northwesterly so far and things like that. Um, so there is some information in there, a surveyor going back through the title search coming back out, if, right, fine. might find that he could say that's useful and informative. The other side is, as Tracy pointed out, we know where the structures were and we know that where the access was so that pretty well indicates where the right of way would have been. And then in the sequencing of this, if somebody owned property on Main Street, which was the post office and where the locker is, those two lots, and then somebody acquired the grist mill and wanted to run that operation and build that structure, they would have to get a right of way for the shortest trip out to Main Street across that property. So I'm just saying, as a sequence that could be, that's maybe where that right of way came through. And that's when the grist mill was given up the right of way that went between the post office and the lockers was conveyed. And that's just a suggestion, but I agree entirely. A surveyor would be able to give you a lot more definitive information, what it, how it exists in the records and it might be helpful. And he might even be able to say, some of these things seem to indicate this or give you some dimensions on the ground, as Wiz pointed out, they will produce a map. Another thing is, as far as where the boundaries are, this is state law, it's where the surveyor says it is. So if they come to a determination, they say, here are the boundaries, unless another surveyor comes in and can dispute it, that's where they are. The way I see it, we're trying to save the town effort by proving it already is a town street. So you don't have to lay it out again because it's already there and it's already laid out and it's been in existence since 1875, not as a town street until 1929. But, you know, I think it I think it's a done deal. But if you want to do some more research, go for it. So if it's a done deal, why are we discussing it? because Norm is pushing people into the river when they try and park on the street. And you guys are saying it's a personal problem that the neighbors should sort out. He says he if that street belongs to him. And now I'm on TV saying that. So um, I, I guess I would just say that I still come back to, I think if we want to settle it, we, we can't just wave a magic wand and have it be so. We have to do a little research. Yes. Whatever you feel you need to do. I just think that people that live on River Street should be able to access their own buildings from River Street without being bullied. And I think they should be able to park in front of their own buildings if there's space between the right of way and their buildings to do so without somebody telling them that they can't. I just, you know, otherwise those two buildings are basically done. They're toast. Nobody can live there. Nobody can run a business there. Um, and that's ridiculous. And that can't be, I just can't believe the town let that happen because they've been viable businesses in the past where people parked in front of them. So I don't know what happened between the 1970s when that was perfectly fine and now. Right, I think, I think that's exactly the point. We don't know what happened. We don't know why this is the way it is. So you know, another thing on a slightly tangent to that is that um there are a bunch of property owners down there. And sometimes if when you're just when you're talking, if, if we're going to take this ahead and talk to a surveyor, it might be worth talking to the other property owners and see if they do want their property surveyed because um, it shares the cost and some a lot of the, the research would then overlap. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if 
if you all think that makes sense or not, that might be get a little bit better um, cost wise for everybody involved if we do it together. I think one step at a time, talk to a surveyor and see what can come of that. Yeah. And then talk about what's going to happen. So that was the motion to yep. talk to a surveyor because we'd like to know whether they can tell us anything that will clarify this situation for us. Yeah, and Wiz seconded, I think, right? Yeah. So I'd like to close our discussion there. And um, so all in favor of having Sean discuss with a surveyor and see what can be done, please say aye. 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 And so I count Wiz, Eric, Sherry, Lucian, and Kaylee, and that's all of us on the eyes. So the eyes have it, motion carries. And um, thank you. I know this is a long and winding road, but I think that that's the way that we get there is to try to figure out, you know, document. It's a short and very straight road, actually. <laughs> Just a very short road. It is. Mm. So small. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, you know, I don't know. <laughs> it's a good point, though. It's so small. Um, That's good. Just keep the sense of humor. That's good. We, I like it. <laughs> uh, all right. Next up is select board reports. Anybody have anything quick? It's getting late. I'll save it for next time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, New business. I had a couple notes. New business. We were going to talk about town meeting. Um, Sean was going to give an update. Rachel's waving. Um, what I know is this. Um, Alberta is receiving information from the Secretary of State's office. It looks like the way things are going to go for this year's town meeting is there would be no type of a public meeting, not even virtual based. But effectively, what we will oh, yeah. be doing is going forward on producing the town report, and then anything uh, budget-wise, appropriation-wise, is Australian ballot. Right. So one there'd be year, an actual vote. One year. One year only. One year. The, yeah, just for this year with the state of emergency. But we're going to have a our I believe our um, hurdle in all this is going to be um, we will need to have public information sessions as we normally do, but I would expect greater attendance at those because I think typically nobody shows up at the public information center uh, meetings because they figure, well, I'm going to go to town meeting anyway. Those are usually timed out with select board meeting dates, right? They are, yeah. and we can still do them. I just, well, we'll see what happens. If a lot of people come, it, it may be, may be uh, difficult to to kind of maybe unwieldy on Zoom, but I guess we'll deal with it. I can't speak to that. The only thing I got from Alberta was that what she's getting at was just given the current numbers, uh, you know, we're going to not be seeing an in person or virtual for the actual town meeting event, is what I got. That's what right. I can report on. Again, all all Australian ballot, forward. paper ballot. Yeah. Who is? Are they all ballots that you have to go to the polling place to pick up, or are they going to be mailed out? I'm not sure at this time. I asked Alberta about, is that, are you indicating to me you would have to have a polling place to open? I could say, I can answer this question. She said, yeah, it looks like we would have to have a polling place open. So I don't know if that means you have the option to do uh, mail-in. I, I can't say. I don't want to get too far ahead. They'll probably here. figure it out <laughs> as we go along here. I mean, you know, we don't know until we know. So we, I think we probably yeah. are not going to get anywhere tonight with it. I mean, no, I, that's just the radio, update and yeah they're reporting it but you know i'm sure alberta will come to us when she's got a little bit firmer deal don't you think yeah it seems to be developing the know. state's still trying to figure it out is my yeah. understanding yeah, yeah. what okay. if we did an informational meeting like a little closer to town meeting day um there was a special meeting i don't i don't know if this is what y'all had in mind, but just so that it's sort of like, like instead of just having it at a select board meeting like we usually do, it'd be sort of like a special thing, a little bit like town meeting. I think we'd have better attendance if we did something like that. Yeah, um, it'd have to be virtual, but yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it'd be at a more convenient time for people. I don't know what that would be. but Sure. Yeah. And we could do more than one, potentially. I don't know. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. All right. Any other new business, old business? Eric, can I mention something on behalf of the uh, town manager's office? Yeah. It's actually town clerks. It's uh, for anybody who has a water and sewer account with us. And I believe this is pertinent for other utilities. There is a grant program that has come from uh, Department of Public Service and it helps for paying of past due municipal and non uh, water and wastewater sewer bills. Again, I think this is uh, there's an opportunity for somebody who might be ex experiencing uh, economic hardship. So right now, uh, anybody who is a customer with Hardwick Water and, and Wastewater, if you are experiencing a problem uh, paying and you have had lost income because of the COVID-19 situation, we have information up on our website right now. Um, it's the second news item grant program to help delinquent water and sewer accounts. So I just call our customer's attention to this. Uh, I know the electric department has information about this on that side as well. So just please be advised. This is an opportunity to help you, you know, keep up, if you will. Got it. Um, Rachel was waving her hand. Did you want to say something quickly before we? Uh, I just want to say thank you all very much, Wiz, Lucian, Eric, Kaylee, Sherry, Sean and whoever's behind Town of Hardwick for the hours and the goodwill that you put into working for this town. I really appreciate it. I'm really, really admire you all very much. Just wanted to say that. <laughs> thank you. That's all. So thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Um, on that very nice note, um, I would entertain a a uh, motion to move to executive session to discuss loan contracts pursuant to 24, chapter 24 VSA, or sorry, title 24 VSA, chapter 2149. So moved. Six, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we got to so move from, was that Wiz? Yep. I'll guys, second like, it. Hoodoo. Recording now. We're recording. Good. So now we're public. We're back out of our executive session. Um, I think it would be great to have a motion to uh, direct the town manager to go ahead and complete paperwork that um, continues Hardwick's loan position in the uh, subordinate um, position and also um, enter into an agreement for uh, um, uh, wrap uh, what a uh, accelerated payoff of the loan from Caledonia Spirits over ten months. It's so five thousand a month. Yeah, five thousand roughly. Yeah, five thousand a month. And Wiz is saying so moved. Mm -hmm. Sean, did you get all that? Yeah, I have a direct. Oh, you have a recording. <laughs> direct town, yeah, I don't know. I just got to help me to just say it again. Uh, direct town manager's office to provide correspondence to Cal Spirits that uh, uh, continue town continues uh, position, uh, subordinate position, and would be uh, directing them to do accelerated payoffs over the next 10 months, approximately $5,000 per month. Yep. So that's direct correspondence or it's uh, mend their contract? Um, I guess it, it, it would be a, it would be an amendment it, to the contract. Was in it? writing, yeah. So. Some or, sort of cover, just some. Uh, Casey some will instrument. have this detail. Casey will know this from her banking background. Exactly. There'll be some some written instrument that does it. Um, do we need to address the previously? Uh, do, do we need to note the previous motion, Eric? The previous motion was paid off just say this the previous actions uh not considered at this time does that need to be addressed now? so just before we do that can we sorry did we have a second to that motion because wiz made the motion second okay lucian's got a second so yeah so um yeah i guess we should note in the minutes that this this action nullifies our 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 previous action of Friday, well, that was Friday, I think. The or supersedes our our action from was it Friday the thirteenth? I think so. 
What's today? 1920 B 13. Yeah. Friday the 13th. Okay. So this supersedes our action from the 13th. All right. But that's just a note in the minutes. Um, so we have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Kaylee. Aye. Okay. I count everyone. So thank you all because I really want to have a snack and go to bed. <laughs> Sorry, it was so long. I tried to make it shorter this time. What uh, it is. You it is good. Yeah. good night. Good night. Good night, night everybody. Good night. Good night.